what they're framing as their scientific kind of approach to this is really just storytelling and creating narratives that they tend to use information that they call science in order to like uphold their narrative. So I just don't think this is about science anymore. I don't think this is about interpretations of evidence. I think it's about narcissistic indifference. I think it's about ego. Welcome to The Proof Podcast, a space for science-based conversation exploring the health and longevity benefits that come with mastering nutrition, physical exercise, mindfulness, recovery, sleep, and alignment. Facts, nuance, and trustworthy recommendations, minus the hyperbole. Howdy friends, great to be here with you. I'm your host, Simon Hill. I'm a qualified physiotherapist and nutritionist with an undergraduate science degree and a master's in the science of human nutrition. Today, we have Dr. Alan Flanagan and Danny Lennon, both previous guests on the show, back to explore nutrition, cholesterol, and heart disease. This is a topic we've covered in previous episodes, but with these guys visiting Sydney, I wanted to take the opportunity to sit down and in a single episode, cover the evidence that we have on cholesterol and heart disease and address claims made by certain dietary camps online. Claims like, well, if you're metabolically healthy, high cholesterol doesn't matter. Or if cholesterol was the problem, why don't veins get atherosclerosis? And why would our body make cholesterol if it's bad for us? We cover all of these and more. Importantly, while this topic can be often very hard to follow with lots of scientific terminology or jargon, I did leave this convo feeling like we did a pretty good job breaking things down and using analogies to help make it more interesting and accessible. Although I'll let you be the judge of that. Perhaps you can leave a comment on YouTube under the video or on Instagram and share your thoughts. All right, let's do this. Please enjoy. This is Dr. Alan Flanagan, Danny Lennon, and myself coming at you from Bondi Beach, Australia. Alan. Yeah. Welcome back. (laughs) Danny, welcome. Thanks for having me. It's uh, nice to be doing this in person. It is. Had a fun dinner last night. Yes. Yes. And yeah. you look very, you look like you're in a very cheeky mood. I'm a bit worried. <laughs> I may be. <laughs> I think dinner last night probably teed us up for this. <laughs> oh, I did. I was thinking actually, if you were sitting around us, um, they kind of got a podcast. <laughs> if they were oh my God, in. right? Yeah. Yeah. I think there was that like couple that were like next to us. And I was like, I wonder whether they're interested in nutrition and why they keep hearing this person wanting people to die. <laughs> like, I must have mentioned at least three people that I, I visit cardiovascular events on. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well. Not nice people. Let's see listeners. where this, uh, this episode takes us. Yeah. Um, so I thought we could kind of channel our energy into all things cholesterol, mm-hmm. um, heart disease. I know you guys have covered this brilliantly on your show. So I think perfectly placed to kind of uh, bridge the gap between a- academia and the science that's in the literature and all of the various claims made online. Mm. And just to help that person that's kind of caught the middle, which is a lot of obviously what you guys do so well. Um, so I'm interested in, in trying to kind of step through this, understand what we do and, and, and don't understand about uh, cardiovascular disease and the kind of pathophysiology and then along the way let's try and bring up the play devil's advocate and bring up okay well this is where this claim might be made mm-hmm. and as you often say Alan the there are a lot of claims but one of the great things is that there is evidence that can actually be pointed to to help explain those yeah. and so along the way if we can kind of draw attention to that claim that someone may have come across and then speak to the evidence um, that may help refute that and, and clear things up. I think that could be really instructive. Yeah. Mm. Probably the first, the best place, and I was thinking about where to start, there's a lot of different terms that get thrown around. Cholesterol, triglycerides, mm-hmm. lipids, uh, LDL cholesterol, LDL particles, ApoB. And so if you are seeing lots of claims online and there's terminology that you're not fully... Um, sort of understanding or familiar with, it can make it very hard to, mm. to track all of this conversation. And I think we can probably take some of those terms a little bit mm. for granted, what they actually mean. So um, why don't we start there with the kind of basics of what lipids are, 
you know, how our body is, is transporting um, cholesterol and, and triglycerides and, and then through that we might be able to kind of step into what the actual pathophysiology is and, and what's going wrong. So I'll start with some basics and you guys can both fill in any gaps, I think, from there. <clears throat> the way I, I start at a very simple level for people just hearing about some of those terms you mentioned is they probably have some familiarity with getting a, a lipid test with their, their doctor or their GP. And this will be a collection of, of different markers, many of which we'll probably discuss today. And within that, they will hear things like total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, maybe triglycerides. But most of the time, they'll typically hear about the good and bad cholesterol. And we can certainly talk about whether that's uh, appropriate ways to think of it. But within uh, that kind of class of, of different types of uh, lipids, when we focus in on cholesterol, this LDL or HDL designation relates to the density of lipoproteins, which are what carry this cholesterol around. So probably the first important distinction that needs to be made is that the something like LDL cholesterol relates to the cholesterol content within a certain particle that we call a lipoprotein. And in this case, if it's LDL, it's, it's of a low density. And so already now we have a few different branches that we should maybe highlight mm -hmm. for people to, to keep track of that first of all, we can move cholesterol around the body in certain particles. These are called lipoproteins. And based on the density of those, we have a different a whole range of different lipoproteins, many of which we'll probably talk about. LDL, which is the most common type of, of lipoprotein we'll probably discuss today, is low-density lipoprotein. Then we have intermediate-density lipoproteins, or IDLs. We can have high-density lipoproteins. We can also have VLDLs, so very low-density lipoproteins. And within all those, there's a cholesterol content associated. So when someone gets an LDL cholesterol test, that is measuring what is the cholesterol content within all your LDL particles, or, or at least it's, it's a calculation mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think that's the, the first distinguishing feature uh, we, we can say that we have uh, cholesterol that could be uh, moved around the body essentially within lipoproteins. There's different classes of these. They relate to uh, the, the kind of atherogenic profile, as we'll probably talk about, depending on which uh, lipoprotein we're talking about. Um, and yeah, that would be the, the starting point mm -hmm. I typically outline. But I think even within that can start to get quite right. confusing. Yeah. So I don't know if there's any particular points we need to hammer home. I think the main, the main kind of additional point is with the distinction between LDL and HDL as lipoproteins. I think the best way for listeners to conceptualize the, the importance of the difference is we can relate to each of these as forward cholesterol transport and reverse cholesterol transport. Mm -hmm. So LDL is responsible for forward cholesterol transport. As Danny said, that means that the cholesterol is contained within these lipoproteins, low-density lipoproteins, and it's being transported to tissues in the body, all tissues, and it's delivering this cholesterol to cells. And this is going to be important because I think at some point today we're going to discuss a really common claim, which is, well, the body needs cholesterol. Yeah, absolutely it does. Or they'll say, it's a raw material, we need it for hormone production. Yeah, we do. But that it's doesn't speak membranes. to, yeah, mm. that doesn't speak to how much we need mm. right. and how much our cells actually require to do that job. So we'll, we'll circle back to that. So forward cholesterol transport, LDL bringing cholesterol to tissues for it to use, and then reverse cholesterol transport, HDL bringing cholesterol back to the liver in order to drop it off and recycle mm -hmm. it, basically. Um, and there are other lipoprotein subclasses. I don't necessarily know that we need to get into all of them. But one important potential distinction as well is to do with um, kind of internal versus external cholesterol intake and production. So with VLDL, which ultimately will become LDL over when it, when the cholesterol content, the triglyceride content is broken down in those lipoproteins, is it produced in the liver. And then it's kind of produced to put in new fat triglycerides and fatty acids, and it will carry out and it will come out 
as a particle that has a lot of triglyceride, a lot of fat carried in it, and it will have cholesterol. And then as that triglyceride gets broken down, it essentially over time becomes smaller right. um, and ends up as a low density lipoprotein. So it's the same particle, but it's, it's, just been, transcending. it's just been renamed by us. It's transcending. Because it's, ch it's changed its kind of form. Yeah, it's changing its form over time. And, and a real difference, you know, Danny mentioned the term density of the lipoprotein. So that the reason that this is important, as, as we get kind of a more refined understanding of how all of these interact, essentially, is the density refers to the, the relationship between the fat content of the lipoprotein, the lipid content, and the protein content. Mm -hmm. So uh, a, a lipoprotein with high density, like HDL, has a lot more uh, protein relative to lipids. Whereas a VLDL has a lot more fat, basically, and lower and protein. Mm -hmm. And the relevance of that is for a compound, for a lipoprotein like HDL, it doesn't really have much capacity to take on fat, take on triglycerides. And so if we have high levels of triglyceride, for example, HDL and LDL can end up being overburdened and remodel. And so we end up with kind of low HDL, we end up with LDL in small, denser particles. And again, these are factors that are just accepted as part of what happens with mm. lipoprotein metabolism, but they're, they're jumped on by people who say, ah, well, you see, it's not really LDL, it's these other factors. Mm -hmm. Well, they're all important in the overall picture, but LDL is by far and away the most important because it's the most abundant lipoprotein carrying cholesterol in circulation. Okay. And because it's going forward cholesterol transport, meaning that it's got way more circulating time and way more contact time essentially with our arteries. Okay. And so I think um, some folks will be exposed to the, the term ApoB. Mm -hmm. And it seems like the conversation is starting to shift a little bit from LDL cholesterol to ApoB um, being potentially, uh, at least in, in certain circumstances, a better predictor of cardiovascular disease um, or marker of kind of risk of atherosclerosis. Where does ApoB come into this conversation with regards to these different types of lipoproteins and, and why is it important? And this probably starts to take us down the, the, the path of the pathology and what's going wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to go? yeah so uh, uh, this is kind of something that has refined our understanding over time. And so the best way to think of this is, as I just noted, for something like an LDL cholesterol or an LDL-C that someone might get measured, that is measuring the cholesterol content of that lipoprotein. But we can also care about how many of these lipoproteins we have. What is the number of particles? And so one way to try and assess the number of not only LDL but other lipoproteins, apart from HDL importantly, which I'll come back to, is by measuring this apolipoprotein B, or as we call an ApoB, uh, that sits on these lipoproteins. Now, Im importantly, this doesn't sit on the HDL particle, but it'll be on the LDL, IDLs, VLDLs, these other lipoproteins that we consider to be more atherogenic than HDL. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure we'll explain that in a bit more detail in a while. And some of that relates to the density of that lipoprotein and therefore its size, mm -hmm. um, and also this forward and right. reverse transport. But so we have a way to measure the number of those atherogenic lipoproteins, LDLs, IDLs, VLDLs, et cetera, that all contain, that have this ApoB sitting on them. So there's one of these ApoBs on each of those particles. So by measuring ApoB, it's giving us a good idea of the number of these different particles. And that refinement in understanding risk over time has essentially highlighted that it's not necessarily the, the cholesterol content per se of those particles, but the, uh, that is an important part, but the overall number of those particles, if we have much more ApoB-containing lipoproteins, that elevates risk. Uh, there's, a, there's a concept of concordance and discordance, which we're going to explore more. Uh, where in certain cases, if they're concordant, that means that pretty much the an increased amount of ApoB or number of LDL containing particles, let's say, would be concordant or rise linearly with the increase in LDL cholesterol. 
In some cases, it can be discordant, which is where one may be a better right. predictor than the other. So is that because in, in those, those circumstances, you have greater numbers of like VLDLs and IDLs, which also contain the APOB um, and, and less LDL? Is so that, there's, it's interesting that there's a kind of, a, as, I, as I understand that, a kind of heterogeneity here in mm. terms of that distribution where you can have either an underestimation or overestimation mm -hmm. of risk. So let's say you take someone that has <clears throat> an LDL cholesterol that would be in the normal range that would, we would indicate as that low risk. But for whatever reason, they, their um, APOB or right. even their LDL particle count is really high, so that would put them in the high risk count. In, in a situation like that, that person could be at higher risk than indicated by their LDL mm -hmm. cholesterol result. Mm -hmm. But you also have, it seems on a distribution, people at the opposite end, that the LDL cholesterol C might be, uh, look a bit higher relative to, they actually have a, maybe a lower APOB uh, count or a lower LDL mm -hmm. particle count. Is that because they have, they, they have kind of more large, fluffy, LDL particles that are carrying more cholesterol, but there's less of them. Is that, is that how you'd end up in that position? So it'd be, yeah, it'd be essentially, as I understand it, the, uh, as Alan said, this protein and cholesterol content that we have generally for these different classes of lipoproteins. But of course, there's some variation. There's some kind of range within them of, of how much each of those particles may have. So if you, in a certain individual, have a greater cholesterol content per lipoprotein for that situation, uh, that would lend itself to. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so bottom line though, the, the the best predictor, or and and the best way of kind of avoiding misinterpretation, if your interpretation, if you're just looking at LDL, is to go directly to the number of particles and measure ApoB. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. ApoB is probably the strongest uh, indicator relative to certainly an LDL cholesterol uh, number, uh, and that's twofold. One, it's you're actually getting the number of particles as opposed to the cholesterol content, but also you're accounting for other lipoproteins apart from LDL, which yeah. are also atherogenic. Do you think most doctors sort of recognize that, and is that something that you think will start to make its way into routine blood tests? So it is recognized. Um the various, you know, the EAS have, have recognized the importance of a direct measure of APOB um, generally. Um, it's specifically recognized in the situations of discordance mm -hmm. that Danny was talking about, which which seems to affect about a quarter of the population, around 25%. Okay. So mm -hmm. it's not an insubstantial Big. number of people for whom only estimating LDL cholesterol might mischaracterize the nature of their risk. Um, but there are calls now to just in everyone have have a direct measure of APOB as as kind of the standard. But that's not going to necessarily be something that's happening overnight, mm -hmm. um, because it's kind of cheaper and easier to measure. And, and LDL cholesterol isn't necessarily directly measured when you're in primary care. It's calculated from what's known as the Friedwald equation. So you know, yes, APOB is more refined as a marker because it's capturing all of the every atherogenic lipoprotein in circulation irrespective of its actual mm -hmm. subclass but at the same time um, there's additional you know cost and mm -hmm. and and um kind of um you know equipment and otherwise right. in, in implications here so yes it's more ideal but it's it's not necessarily going to be something that that happens overnight although over time i can imagine that there will be a a push to shift mm. um screening towards direct right. measures of apop it seems it seems to be going in that direction what do you think about non hdl as a marker so if you cuz that's that shows up on most routine blood yeah. tests that's pretty similar to apop so right? it's it's a it's a good mark prior to the apop kind of era, so mm. to speak, if we're in that now, non-HDL was as good a marker as you could get for capturing, again, all mm. atherogenic lipoproteins in circulation that were not HDL. Uh -huh. So as Danny said, HDL does not contain APOB. HDL is reverse cholesterol transport. It, can, it, it expresses another apopiloprotein. And so it's not involved in the processes and it, also because of its size as well, mm -hmm. you know, hypothetically where HDL to get into the artery, it could actually kind of get out basically. Okay. So non-HDL was providing a relatively, you know, crude 
but still, you know, accurate enough for prediction estimate of all other lipoproteins in circulation that were not HDL. Mm -hmm. And that would have covered LDL, it would have covered VLDL, it would have covered, you know, uh, chylomicron remnants and okay. these kind of particles. Um, and if you look at some of the analyses that we're looking, obviously, in terms of predictive um, value for these kind of measurements, then, you know, non-HDL was a very, and, and it still is in certain mm -hmm. contexts, you know, remember that this concept of discordance while a quarter of the population is a lot of people, you know, in in a lot in in a majority of individuals, it, it is still sufficient to you know have an estimate of their LDLC and non HDLC can be right. can be and concordance if you're using if you're looking at and this is, was in one of our statements from Samia Mora's research if you look at LDL cholesterol and non HDL cholesterol, there's a lower proportion of people are discordance mm. if you're looking at those metrics together then LDLC and LDL mm. particle count okay yeah. so it's still a useful metric yeah and I mean one additional thing to that is when we talk about even cases where there is discordance that's still occurring within a certain range right yes. so as some of the cases we may get onto later where people have this incredibly high LDL cholesterol like 300 plus milligrams per deciliter, you're not going to have a situation where someone's right. LDL cholesterol yeah. is, is that high, but like, oh, their APOB nah. is yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, know? Yeah, so it, yeah. it's within a certain range right. that discordance happens yes. and it doesn't, at the extremes, it's just going to mm -hmm. become irrelevant. That's a good point. Well, that's, that's also um, good for folks to know if they speak with their physician and for whatever reason, APOB is expensive or they can't get it, that usually non-HDL is available. Um, okay, so... The way I kind of like to think about this is shipping containers. You know that that mm -hmm. analogy of like mm -hmm. the the shipping containers kind of floating through our blood. That's the lipoprotein, and then on top of that is the uh, sorry, the ship is is the lipoprotein, and then on top of that, the containers, the the freight are the mm -hmm. triglycerides and the cholesterol. cholesterol. Mm -hmm. um, and some of these. Uh, ships have this ApoB protein, mm -hmm. which makes them this kind of special class that we have said is atherogenic, mm -hmm. which uh, I guess is the kind of capacity to enter the artery wall and build up as plaque, which we'll probably go into. Yeah. Do you agree? Is that a kind of... Yeah, that's yeah. the broadest term for an atherogenic right. potential. Okay, so you've got these ships that have this certain protein, they have this capacity to go into our artery wall and potentially build up. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got some other ships that don't have that protein, mm -hmm. that's HDL, they don't have that same sort of atherogenic potential. Mm -hmm. So, and, and these lipoproteins are playing an important role, right? Mm -hmm. that you, they're distributing fats and cholesterol into to tissues. So they're, they're, they're meant to be there at some level, they're doing a, a role. And I think what's interesting is to think about that and then talk about, well, what goes wrong? Right. You know, why would the body have this system in place um, that is, you know, for all intents and purposes, presumably there to actually sustain life and, and, and make us healthy? Mm. Where, do, where do things go wrong? When it gets retained in the artery <laughs> wall. <laughs> so, so one further um, stratification that we can make that's important for the concept that we're talking about of atherogenicity is the size of the so we've we've identified density obviously and importance and the the kind of lower the density the more room there is so to speak on the ship for triglyceride and cholesterol um and the expression of apob is important because it's ultimately that apob moiety that apob compound so to speak on the on the on the ship <laughs> on the lipoprotein that is going to be what sticks it's like the anchor what adheres exactly so that's a really good analogy because yes ship goes into artery so to speak mm -hmm. and drops anchor and it's mm -hmm. apob that is literally anchoring to the artery wall and once there there's a, a whole host of immune and inflammatory processes that will, mm. and, and oxidative processes that will result from that. But a major factor influencing which lipoproteins, which ships can get in in the first place, is the size mm -hmm. of the lipoprotein itself. And size for these compounds would be measured in kind of nanometers. And what we know is that basically any lipoprotein 
under about 70 to 75 nanometers in diameter is small enough to get into the artery. Any compound under that. And any, any lipoprotein over that size is actually too large. So when we eat food and we digest the dietary fat in that meal, that dietary fat is absorbed at first into these very large particles known as chylomicrons. Mm -hmm. They're too large to penetrate the artery. So, they, so chylomicrons are not atherogenic. But what can happen is, as the body starts to break down, as enzymes start to break down the triglyceride, the fat that we've consumed in the diet that's been packaged into these really large, fluffy, buoyant lipoproteins gets broken down, you end up with progressively less triglyceride, and then as a proportion, more, mm -hmm. more cholesterol there. So it creates what are known as chylomicron remnants. Those remnants can be atherogenic because their size has been, they've been depleted. Mm -hmm. And then we have VLDL, very low density lycoprotein, which is synthesized in the liver. Mm -hmm. So the chylomicrons are the exogenous pathway of mm -hmm. triglyceride intake, dietary fat. And then VLDL can be synthesized in the liver mm -hmm. if the liver is having to upregulate production of new fat um, from an overconsumption of calories or from fat being dropped to the liver from diet and these kind of things. So VLDL in its exists in kind of two subclasses, VLDL1 and 2. VLDL1 is just large enough, again, not to, necess not to be able to penetrate. But VLDL2, right. smaller VLDL can. So we, so we have smaller VLDL, we have IDL, mm. chylomicron remnants, LDL itself, LP little a, and all of these fit both the classification of expressing APOB, mm -hmm. except for LP little a, but that's, that's just a technicality we can avoid. And the size, and between the two of them, they're able to not just get into the arterial intima, and then APOB, as the analogy of the mm -hmm. anchor, is, is what then sticks right. and adheres okay. to that artery wall, and then the processes okay. begin. Right, so you have these different ships. They're they're dropping off at certain ports. Yep. Some of these uh, triglycerides and 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 cholesterol. Some of the containers are going off, and at a certain point, that ship, the size is is now um, a size that enables it to enter into the artery wall and mm -hmm. can drop its anchor and get stuck. Yeah. Um, okay, so. Something I think that often comes up here is that what I what I would be interested in sort of understanding and, and speaking about is is that sort of process of these particles going into the artery wall. I think transcytosis is the term mm -hmm. that that's often used. Is that normal? And does does sort of do these particles flow in and out, and that's um, completely fine and healthy? Um, or is that pathogenic in and of itself? Because often what I hear is from the counterpoint is that, well, actually, it's, it's not these particles that are kind of going in there and causing the damage. The only time that they would be retained is if there is already some sort of damage there and people point to hypertension or smoking um, or seed oils. So I'm, I'm kind of interested in trying to delineate mm. um, that, what is actually causing the anchor to, to get dropped and the cholesterol to get retained. Did that so make sense? Yeah, it did. So the, the, the two researchers that, that kind of gave us one of the, one of probably the, the greatest breakthroughs in this whole story over the last century, Goldstein and Brown, um, won a Nobel Prize for it, discovered the LDL receptor in the 80s. And, and that, that, has, that has, from there, just accelerated almost everything we know, not just about these processes that we're discussing, but, but even how to intervene to treat atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And in, in one of their papers, they, they had this really nice analogy where they, they called cholesterol and, and LDL a Janus-faced molecule, you know, Janus, the, the, the two-faced god, right? <laughs> and what they meant by that was we have a, a need for cholesterol in the body and we have these lipoproteins, 
but the, the, the very properties of cholesterol and indeed of fats in the body, fats and water don't mix. Someone can go and pour olive oil in their glass of water right mm -hmm. now and they'll see what we're talking about. So we need compounds and cholesterol itself is quite this waxy kind of molecule. Again, not particularly good if you're a, a, a circulatory body that mm -hmm. has blood and plasma and fluid essentially. We need these compounds to be able to transport beneficial material to our cells and to our tissues in order to function. The problem is that the properties from a kind of chemical perspective or are that, 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 that make these compounds what they are, paradoxically is also what can make them deadly if they get to the wrong place. And the wrong place in this case is, is, is into our artery wall. And so we clearly have evolved a kind of threshold at which there is sufficient capacity in the body to have these compounds uh, on, on the ship, so to speak, to have enough in circulation for meeting our physiological requirements Ooh, and a range of um, levels in the body at which we can have these compounds in the circulation where they'll be able to do their job, drop the raw material that we need into, into port, so to speak, get it to the tissues that require it, and this process can, can go. We can forward transport cholesterol and other material to cells. We can bring it back and recycle it. Within a certain threshold, we've, we've clearly evolved the capacity to have those functions actually work without causing any additional um, stress or, or damage mm. to the body. Over certain thresholds is when we get into a situation where there is simply too much, so to speak, cargo uh, and too many ships. Mm. And there is an inability at that point for the, 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 the requirements for our cells for cholesterol specifically are very low. We have the capacity to synthesize that cholesterol in the body endogenously. We do require it for really important functions, but the actual level required for optimal function and, and the level required during maximal phases of growth in the human body are very small. What is that? Like, give us, give us a number. About 30 milligrams mm -hmm. per deciliter. Right. And, and we know that because that's, that's what Goldstein and Brown looked at in kind of like infant development. So Is that really similar to um, primates? So if you, if you were to look at, at animals, um, and I think I've looked at some of this, this research, but um, if I'm correct, they don't tend to get atherosclerosis and they have much lower level. I mean, in experiments, you can give them atherosclerosis. Mm -hmm. But in the, in the wild, do, do you know what their kind of level of LDL cholesterol so is? So any, any other mammals that have been looked at, any other primates that have been looked at, none of these species or, or indeed like um, other animal models that have been looked at come anywhere near to expressing the levels of lipoproteins and cholesterol that modern human, mm -hmm. particularly Western industrialized populations exhibit. Yeah. Um, and they don't develop atherosclerosis. Uh, and we have, you know, evidence not just from, you know, kind of hunter-gatherer, quote-unquote, populations uh, who, who don't develop atherosclerosis. Um, there are some myths that have emerged even within that, particularly mm -hmm. focused on um, indigenous Inuit cultures in the Arctic. Uh, that's just you know, a myth, this idea that they do not develop coronary artery disease is, is not the case at all. It was based on some shoddy assumptions in the 1970s that really haven't held true um, beyond that. Um, so, so really, there, there's, 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 there's very little evidence of atherosclerosis developing in any of these other, in other non-human primates uh, who have obviously much le lower levels of cholesterol in other animal species. Um, the, a lot of these animal models are, are actually how we know the importance of the LDL cholesterol uh, receptor, of the, of the, of the um, mm -hmm. LDL receptor generally. 
So at that level, at say um, 30 milligrams per deciliter, mm -hmm. let's say in a human, um, and I think there are uh, the PISA study, I think is one study I've looked at that kind of looked at this and um, was looking at levels of subclinical atherosclerosis in different um, uh, people with different levels of, of cholesterol. And in mm. that paper, I think it was at 40 or 50 milligrams per deciliter. Those were the only people that didn't have any ath subclinical atherosclerosis. Um, but just to kind of summarize what you're saying is if atherosclerosis is not inevitable, Mm -hmm. So if if you if you have uh, an LDL cholesterol level of say 30, 40 milligrams per deciliter your entire mm -hmm. life, based on the evidence um, that's out there, you're saying that you, that, that you, person you would not, not develop, develop atherosclerosis. atherosclerosis. Mm -hmm. Right. And is that actually, I mean, clearly there are some papers looking at it where people do have that level, but is that is that a level, 30, 40 is very low. Is that actually something you think people can achieve without pharmaceutical intervention? Um, in the modern context, probably not. But you know, again, a lot of a lot of a lot of um, unacculturated populations don't necessarily have cholesterol, LDL cholesterol that low, or total cholesterol that low. You know, so so it seems that in otherwise healthy individuals, the, the threshold appears to be around eighty milligrams mm -hmm. per deciliter. That seems to be uh, the range up to that point where, again, in otherwise healthy individuals, atherosclerosis doesn't progress mm -hmm. at thresholds under that. Um, and so, and from a number of studies that have looked at actual regression of plaque in the arteries from achieving certain targets in primary prevention, that's now the, the delineation for targets to treat. So in, in primary prevention, the aim is to get people's LDL cholesterol to 70 milligrams per deciliter or less. In secondary prevention, in people who've already had a coronary event or a cardiovascular event, they're high risk, they're already on likely a maximally tolerated statin. Mm -hmm. The aim is to further use additional pharmacotherapies, specifically now real enthusiasm for PCSK9 inhibitors, to get that LDL cholesterol down to less than 30 milligrams mm -hmm. per deciliter mm -hmm. in order to fully kind of rule out almost okay. the, the, the risk of of a second event. But, it, you know, again, in high-risk individuals, other events mm. still occur. Okay. Um, but yeah, they're, they're the two kind of distinctions we can make now in terms of primary and secondary prevention and kind of targets to, to treat too. So let's just to close the loop on, I guess, the damage, because I think mm -hmm. um, that's a claim that's often made is that, well, it might be that, you know, you're seeing people um, with higher LDL cholesterol, have higher risk of atherosclerosis. Um, uh, it, it may be that these people also um, are insulin resistant or metabolically are, are unhealthy. Mm -hmm. They're consuming a standard Western diet. And so they're damaging the endothelium mm -hmm. and then the LDL cholesterol, I mean, there's a number of claims here. Some people will go as far to say is that the LDL cholesterol is actually reparative and is right. is part of the, the healing process coming into the subendothelial space to actually help with the um, inflammatory process. So what do we know with regards to what's actually causing the damage in the very first place? Is there any truth to this idea that you could have high LDL cholesterol and it wouldn't be retained in the wall if you were you know, completely healthy in all other aspects of your life. <clears throat> I think this is interesting because as far as my understanding goes that even within the context of uh, a healthy uh, endothelial function, let's say, someone can still have the, the this retention of, of uh, lipoproteins once that amount in circulation is high enough and so it, it very much similarly parallels the conversation around oxidized lipoproteins that are here as well, right? That it's only a problem if they're oxidized. Well, really, this is, we know that that occurs after they've been retained, right? And then there can be oxidization leading to that process. In the same way, I think uh, without damage the uh, endothelium, you can still have retention of these, these lipoproteins. And so the way I think it is best to try and think through this is that these are, are very real 
things that can contribute to risk and mm. are negative. So if you have worse endothelial function, right. that is certainly uh, more negative of an outcome than so starting it could compound with good, things. Mm -hmm. Right, it can exacerbate th that that problem in the same way. If someone has really high levels of inflammation, we know this is is. Uh, going to lead to worse outcomes typically or raises risk. But those themselves are n shouldn't be thought of in the same way that we think of an elevated ApoB, where we can see this as a causal in and of itself to drive atherosclerosis. Those other factors are more going to moderate someone's risk mm -hmm. uh, or alter someone's risk if you have higher or lower levels of inflammation, or you have differences in endothelial function. And at least that's the way I've tried to conceptualize right. that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if... So, you know, can I add, ask one question there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, because um, you mentioned before, if you, if you have low ApoB levels, mm -hmm. and, and particularly across an entire lifetime, below that threshold, it would be, we, we wouldn't see atherosclerosis, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, is a, a kind of another way of looking at this is you know, those different things that people point to, whether it's uh, consuming seed oils or inflammation um, or insulin resistance. If you have ApoB count low and you have some of those factors, so in that instance, would someone still not develop atherosclerosis because the LDL particle count, the ApoB count, is so low? Y yes, but mm. that doesn't mean that they would be healthy and avoid all disease endpoints. And, and this is an important distinction because there's a really um, important way that we have to think about biomarkers. And this is something Danny and myself discussed with Professor Chris Packard on an episode um, because it was Professor Packard who, who I first saw propose this distinction. How do we classify biomarkers? What are they telling us? So for something like LDL cholesterol, that's a biomarker in the causal pathway of, of disease. Forward cholesterol transport, the most abundant transporter of cholesterol in the circulation. Uh, and that's in the that's the causal pathway driving these processes when it gets into the artery, is retained and causes these processes that lead to the development of plaque in that artery. And then we have other markers, some of which we've discussed, for example, like you can measure triglycerides and you can measure HDL. They're not causal on their own, but they help to really give you the big picture of an individual's risk. So we could take someone, we could take two people with high LDL and we could take one that has low HDL and high triglycerides. That would typically mean that they have central adiposity hepatic fat, liver fat accumulation, insulin resistance in the liver. So they have a, a clustering of, of risk factors that mean that their overall risk is higher. Um, and what people who deny LDL causality do is they look at that and they say, well, you've got all this stuff going on. LDL can't be causal. No, LDL remains causal, but that overall risk profile for this individual is higher. There's Am much more. It amplifies it. It amplifies it. And so then we can have someone who's isolated high LDL and maybe they're, they have high HDL and they have low triglycerides. But again, LDL is the causal pathway. HDL is not causal. Um, and they will post, point to those things and miss the, miss the fact that LDL is the causal pathway and will drive disease. And, right. and, so, and so one way that we need to kind of think about this is causal pathway systems or report or biomarkers and then biomarkers of damage. So coronary uh, al calcium, artery calcium, CAC score, people love to point at that, but that's just a biomarker of damage, right? So it may not necessarily um, be present at a certain point in time, even if someone has a certain cholesterol level, because the impact of LDL and, and of atherogenic lipoproteins is cumulative across a lifespan. So just because you get an L a CAC scan at the age of 40 and you're like, oh, great, even though I have higher LDL, I'm, I'm fine because of this. This damage is cumulative that's, over decades. That's a very popular um, thing for people in the carnivore community to tweet. Yes. When kind of um, trying to substantiate yeah. the fact that they're, they're chosen They've been on a diet, diet for a year, their right. LDL is through the roof, they get their CAC score and it's like, great, come back in 20 years. <laughs> mm. And this is, this is the problem with their their almost willful mischaracterization of biomarkers. 
And, and biomarkers also helps to understand a really important concept, or these classifications of biomarkers help us understand a really important concept, which is the difference between something that is causal and something that's an effect modifier, right? So as Danny said, like, the, if you've got insulin resistance and these other factors, they are going to amplify or they're going to be an effect modifier to the magnitude of impact of the causal risk factor. But they don't invalidate the causality of that risk factor. Mm. And they're not necessarily direct targets for treatment mm. in themselves. So if you had someone that had high LDL and these other factors, and you thought, actually, I'm not going to bother with the LDL because we're going to make them, we're going to lower their insulin resistance. And otherwise, it's literally avoid, it's, it's, it's treating ancillary, mm. modifying factors over intervening to eliminate the causal right. pathway. So you, in that instance, you could still reduce some of that am amplification mm -hmm. by, by addressing some of those other factors, but you're not getting to the root cause yeah, wasn't it the, the the prominent trial? Maybe it was a uh, targeted at lowering triglycerides, which again is is one of these biomarkers mm -hmm. Alan mentions that yeah can contribute to risk, but in of it, of itself is avoiding the issue around LDL. And as far as I know, with that, they had a triglyceride lowering intervention, but there was there was no change in ApoB, and mm. essentially that trial was just stopped for a futility because yeah. of, yeah. it wasn't doing anything. Yeah. So that kind of speaks this idea that doesn't get really acknowledged that with something like high triglycerides, which we know is a, like an important mm -hmm. risk factor, and that especially people who try and like the LDL denialism is like, let's focus on LD or HDL and triglycerides, mm -hmm. let's say, that if you lower that in the context of ApoB staying high, it's not really changing all okay, that much, yeah. right? And that speaks to what Alan said of we, we have these causal risk factors that are going to drive a lot of it. These other things can alter that. Um, so this is, again, certainly not to say someone shouldn't care about these other things, right? That they shouldn't try and have a, okay. a triglyceride uh, level within range or shouldn't try to have... Uh, like good fasting glucose or whatever other mm. marker they want to mention. But it's getting LDL but down always comes first. Is, okay. Right. And this is what these interventions have done. So there's a concept of residual risk, right? We take someone with high LDL and they've got all these other stuff. They've got high triglycerides. They've got high inflammation, right? LDL comes in all of the interventions that we have. The target still is LDL comes down first, Right, and then you've got residual risk if someone still has high triglycerides because their LDL is low. Mm -hmm. Now, in that, and and this is a really important point. So, Danny highlighted that trial where, oh, we'll just target triglycerides. We won't change, you know, and and there's no change in ApoB, and their risk goes nowhere. And then you have the other trials, like say Reduce It, or Jealous, or the trials that have looked specifically at triglyceride lowering. They're in individuals who've already achieved low LDL. Mm -hmm. So you're furthering their risk reduction by now intervening to get another reporter biomarker down into range as well. We've seen this importantly for the kind of LDL denialist claims with inflammation. So high sensitivity C-reactive protein marker of inflammation, it's a general marker, it's systemic kind of general marker of inflammation. Over two milligrams per liter is considered kind of high. Um, and it's it's and, and we do see a graded increase observationally with higher CRP and cardiovascular disease. But if you look at interventions that have considered LDL reduction in the context of CRP, the SHARP trial, for example, so they stratified participants by whether they had CRP of over three milligrams per liter or under, and irrespective of their inflammation, getting LDL to 70 milligrams was associated with lower cardiovascular mm -hmm. risk. And then we have the prove it and improve it trials, which actually more directly kind of thought about this concept of residual risk as it related to inflammation. And so what you saw in that trial was that in patients who achieved neither getting their LDL under 70 milligrams or getting CRP under two milligrams per liter, they didn't really have much of a risk mm -hmm. reduction in participants who did achieve the LDL target, but remained with CRP over two milligrams per deciliter, there was a risk reduction, but it wasn't to the extent 
as when LDL and CRP mm-hmm. were reduced to under both 70 and 2 milligrams, mm-hmm. uh, respectively. So, so, so achieving your primary goal of LDL reduction still is what will start the risk reduction process. And then we have these other factors like inflammation or triglycerides that become important to consider if they're not in optimal ranges. And at that point, those individuals will benefit from further addressing those mm-hmm. those effect modifying risk factors. Mm-hmm. So what do you think about, and I, I know what you think, but I, I want to to get you to kind of comment on this because I think a lot of people that are, say, tuning into someone like Paul Saladino, mm-hmm. right? I think he, at the center of his message is what we're speaking about here. Mm-hmm. He he will say that high LDL cholesterol um, or a high APOB is not a concern if you are metabolically healthy. Now, you guys have just covered that brilliantly, why it still is mm-hmm. and is an important marker within that context. Um, but he'll point... I think quite often to like the Framingham study Mm -hmm. Mm. and he'll say, you know, this is evidence. And you know what? He speaks with quite a lot of conviction. Mm -hmm. I think we've gone over, you know, there's, there's, you you can listen to it and I can see how for the lay person, it could be compelling. Right. And it sounds like, um, well, Paul Saladino has looked deeper than, mm-hmm. than other people, mm-hmm. than the consensus. He's gone a layer deeper. This yeah. is what it sounds like, right? Yeah. Um, and if you look in the comments section, mm-hmm. you know, the comments like, Paul, you're so brave. Thank you for doing this for humanity, taking on <laughs> Big Pharma. This is the, this yeah. is the kind of yeah. narrative among the, the community mm-hmm. who they want to believe mm-hmm. the, that information he's putting forward. Mm-hmm. Um, but it sounds like it's dangerous information. And I, I want to know what you think about, firstly, directly his, his claim that he makes continuously that Framingham study, if you look deeper, if you look at stratification, mm-hmm. it, it shows that, well, actually, when triglycerides and when HDL were at healthy levels, LDL cholesterol no longer associated with cardiovascular disease. That's the claim that um, he makes, and I believe yeah. I've, I've represented that pretty fairly. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's interesting because because we had a look at the, the the clip that you mentioned where he's recently talked about this again off the back of his his bloods, and as you outline, maybe for some context for people listening, he he says that LDL for him is not necessarily a concern because he is insulin sensitive, and the way he is at least. Uh, coming to that conclusion is off the ba- basis of his HDL and triglycerides. So he will point to, I have high HDL, I have low triglycerides, therefore I have, I'm insulin sensitive and LDL cholesterol is not a, a problem. And as you uh, quite rightly outlined, he talks about the Framingham offspring cohort and does this kind of stratification of, well, if you look at the people with high HDL and low triglycerides, they are at lower risk than the other stratification of, let's say, people with low HDL and higher triglycerides, this more atherogenic lipoprotein phenotype. And indeed, that is correct. But it's what he's not saying is the problem, that when you actually Mm -hmm. look at that stratification of, let's take those people with the high HDL and the low triglycerides, you can also then look at, of those people, if you go higher or lower in LDL cholesterol, Mm -hmm. what is their risk? And the same thing that we've talked about before, that those with the still higher LDL cholesterol, say over, I think, was it 120 maybe Mm -hmm. milligrams per deciliter, are going to be at greater risk than those that have the lower LDL cholesterol. So it just speaks to what Alan's been talking about. Of Sure, there may be some impact on risk of having really high triglycerides or low triglycerides, but still your risk is going to be uh, impacted by your LDL cholesterol. Mm. That's the primary driver of it. So it's, it's leaving out that inconvenient fact that even in your situation you would benefit from LDL cholesterol lowering. Like if you got that lower, you would be at lower risk. Do you think he's aware of that? Because he talks about going, uh, you know, deeper into the... the I don't know with him whether he's... Mm. I don't think he's particularly bright. Um, That's the first thing. Um, I don't think that he's particularly scientifically literate, even though people will be like, well, he's a doctor. I mean, doing going to med school does not necessarily 
make scientific literacy. So I, I don't think I don't think he's I don't think he's very smart. Uh, I don't think he's scientifically literate. I think he's probably a very good businessman, and I think he's and I think when you look at the the kind of underpinnings of conspiratorial thinking, um, a big driver is narcissism. So I think when I look at that community who are building enormous platforms with this kind of you know information, I think they like to portray themselves as a truth seeker because it feeds their ego. Their narcissism makes them indifferent to the potential for harm from that message. Um, and they're not they're they're so blinded by any range of bad thinking practices that they're never really going to be able to come around to moving away from the positions that they've adopted um, because they're 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 not smart enough. They're blinded by a range of cognitive biases and otherwise. And really they've what they're framing as their scientific kind of approach to this is really just storytelling and creating narratives that they tend to use information that they call science in order to like uphold their narrative. So I just don't think this is about science anymore. I don't think this is about interpretations of evidence. I think it's about narcissistic indifference. I think it's about ego. And I, and I see those traits in all of these people, whether it's Saladino, mm. Ivor Cummins, Asim Alhatra or otherwise. Mm. Um, and, 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 it's, and it's a problem, right? Because like you said, hundreds of thousands, if not in the millions of followers with a comment section full of people saying, this is amazing, thank you for bringing me the truth. And a lot of those people will have a cardiovascular event at some mm. point in the next two decades because of this. Mm, that sucks. Yeah. Um, well, I think you just blew any chance of getting an invite onto his show. But um, <laughs> if let's uh, let's throw out a challenge. If you know he he is self proclaimed as a truth seeker, right? If if he was going to sit down and have a conversation with someone that is across the pathophysiology of atherosclerosis, I know you've had mm. uh, Chris Packard and a number of people on your show. Mm. Who would you like to see him talk to if he really really wanted to understand the mechanisms and 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 help uh, his community better understand the relationship between cholesterol and and heart disease. Because I think there might be people tuning into this who mm. are perhaps coming to this show from that community. Not everyone in that community is so far gone. There's probably a large yeah. chunk of people who have really good intentions, are a bit confused, and they would love to see that conversation occur. Who Who would you... Who would you say to Paul Saladin, I have this guy on your show and let's see if you really are interested in the truth. <sighs> Brian, I, I can think of three. I mean, I guess Brian Ference, who has done the genetic studies um, on LDL cholesterol, genetic variants that influence LDL cholesterol. He's done these just brilliant analyses of synthesizing those genetic studies um, and he led the first consensus statement. He was the lead author on the first EAS consensus statement on LDL causality. Um, so, I mean, that would be one. Chris Packard would be another. Um, even my, my MSc supervisor, Professor Bruce Griffin, whose knowledge of lipoprotein metabolism and everything else, would, and, and the dietary influences on, on heart disease. You know, the, the, the problem here is that you've got a guy who is just totally convinced of their own, and... and you know, you'll have an academic who might know the literature inside out, but academics don't speak in the way that the quacks do, right? They don't speak with that just total conviction and certainty that they're mm -hmm. right. So you you wonder what utility any sort of conversation uh, like that would be. We spoke about that yesterday, and academics more likely to use less sort of absolute language, which to the layperson can come across as, Oh, a, a lack of confidence or yeah. understanding of the topic. Yeah, yeah. when you've got yeah. a guy with a spear and his shirt off shouting into a camera mm. that, you know, LDL is a piss poor predictor of cardio... <laughs> no, it's not. It's a linear predictor of mm -hmm. yeah. cardiovascular disease. Okay. Um, so there's there's any number of people in the cardiovascular sciences space that, that, that would, mm. you know, rubbish everything that he says, but... Well, there's a few there for him to consider. Would you throw um, Boren 
into that as well. Yeah, I'm born. Yeah, I'm born, of course. Yeah. Any, any of them, I think you know. <laughs> Tom Dayspring would be Tom another Day one. Tom Dayspring, mm-hmm. yeah. Especially in that kind of mm-hmm. online communication. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a really good one to, to follow so, on Twitter. Yeah, fantastic information. Mm-hmm. And like, yeah, some of his depth of knowledge on lipidology is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. So Peter Atia. Yeah. yeah. I feel like I feel like Saladino would be open to someone like Atia mm-hmm. because Atia is kind of like a bro, basically. Right. And like and and you know, but but his again, his his knowledge of this cardiovascular science yeah. and mm-hmm. stuff. I think is, that's a good one. I can see that yeah, happening. You could see that happening, right? Mm-hmm. I think so. Okay. Um, so yeah. But you know, it's it, again how many how many people are are now too far gone um and that's the the worry here Uh, there's also of a worry of how good faith of a conversation would it be it'd be very easy to paint himself as i'm open to these different ideas right i'm willing to talk to these people yeah having them on talking around because there's ways to actually avoid definitely uh, or, or make it come across like it's a oh, this is a balanced conversation, right? We we both have a difference of opinion, so it's kind of 50-50 and we'll let the listener decide. Whereas this is a topic where there is no 50-50, mm-hmm. right? This, yeah. is, this is like... This is the most yeah. robust body right. of so, evidence in biological So you can create sciences. a false equivalence yes. right. and, and then that can stump people because the, the net result is people go, this is unsettled right. science. Yes. I, th- I, I think that a good example of that, I think, was his conversation with Herman Ponza. Right. Um, so I, I think... Maybe that you know the best format is actually having a, a moderator and and you know I guess quasi debate. Yeah, mm. I mean the problem is if 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 you have someone who's no matter what is said is going to be unwilling to change their position. Yeah. Then by having that conversation and then the next week he puts out a video saying the exact same things he's always been saying yes. about LDL being. Uh, no yeah. good then it, what that's doing is reinforcing to his audience of I've listened to the best arguments out there I've, yeah. look I have evidence I sat down with this person yes. for two hours and I'm still unconvinced exactly so it makes it look like it's a weaker evidence I, base I, I, I'm, and I'm yeah I'm, I'm now kind of at the conclusion particularly you know we had the kind of interaction with, with Dave Feldman on this topic and again you know there's this there's this professing to want to engage in good faith, but there's there's zero good faith from this community at all, you know. And and I I'm cautious now about the utility of these kind of conversations that we're talking about for the reasons Danny's outlined. You know, this false equivalence, this perception they can portray to their audience that I've I've sat down with the best of the best, and you know, uh, it's still inflammation, it, and and it, it it actually I think is ultimately more harmful to the science and the integrity in that evidence base than it is of, of utility. Mm. And I, I, so I worry about that. I'm way more now skeptical of, of how beneficial these kind of conversations are. Okay. And I think that rather we're probably better off focusing on amplifying the voices in the evidence base mm. side and, 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 and amplifying the science of this as much as possible ourselves, hoping that that person who maybe is sitting on the fence, kind of listening to a Paul mm. Saladino, but also maybe kind of listening to us, for example, mm. w- will eventually just have the ability to mm. go, this really seems more mm. robust and right. convincing. Yeah. And and to those that don't and willfully march to the beat of someone like a Paul Saladino's drum, I just don't think we need to, mm-hmm. you know, I, I think we... Good luck to them, you know, but I think worrying about saving them is probably not where we should put our mm-hmm. energy and focus. Okay. Just continue to put out this kind of information and, and, and hope that people, you know, have enough critical thinking capacity. They don't even need scientific literacy, but just to, just to recognize the veracity of, of evidence in one argument versus the bluster and mm-hmm. rhetoric in another. Yeah. Let's let's continue going through some of the I guess various claims that that come up, um, particularly around lowering cholesterol, um, and 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 how that could affect your 
health, let's say, even outside of atherosclerosis. So one of the things that I think is is quite popular online is, um, and you alluded to this before, people talk about, well, the, the benefits of cholesterol and, and usually there's a, a very, um, they rapidly talk about cell membrane fluidity, mm-hmm. uh, hormone production. And then, you know, again, as a lay person, it sounds very scary to think yeah. about lowering your cholesterol. Yeah. Maybe you've had a, a already had a, a cardiovascular event, your doctor has put you on a statin or PCSK9 inhibitor. Now you're coming across this information that's saying, well, actually getting your cholesterol down to that level is going to affect your hormone production mm-hmm. um, and, and, and all these other aspects of, of your health. And you're starting to question, is it such a, a good thing? So what do we know about, I guess, adverse effects or um, if you are aggressively lowering cholesterol, Mm-hmm. Is there, does it pose any risk to other aspects of someone's health? Not that we can see. So in terms of the primary interventions that have looked at, and indeed the, the secondary prevention interventions, because they're often more instructive in this regard because of how low they've taken people deliberately. Um, the evidence that we have that exists doesn't really suggest any adverse effect to going as low and in one of the pre-specified um, subgroup analyses of, of one of the secondary prevention interventions, they looked at getting people down to six milligrams per deciliter. Wow. No evidence of, of adverse effects at that level. Um, and again, you know, these are people who were trying to not just kind of prevent disease, but at this point try to reverse the atherosclerosis that is present in their arteries by, by getting LDL even further low. Um, so this is a slightly kind of different context. But, and so people will say, well, we can't, you know, a big pushback here would be, we, we can't take people that are that diseased essentially already. We can't take people that are that high risk and, and think about this applying. But, but in reality, we can. Going back to that threshold we said earlier that really up to a range of about 80 milligrams per deciliter in the circulation, we have sufficient capacity to uptake the cholesterol that is delivered to cells from LDL um, and to use that and to recycle it. And, and, and all of those processes can, can, can kind of flow, so to speak, without the accumulation of LDL in the circulation that eventually ends up in that LDL getting into the artery. So... What this comes back to really is the, the critical component in all of this is, is the LDL receptor itself. Um, and cells do have the ability to synthesize their own cholesterol. Um, but essentially what ends up happening is the LDL receptor will be expressed on cells. And when LDL is obviously delivering cholesterol to those cells, that receptor is present and can uptake through this receptor pathway that cholesterol into those cells. What ultimately can happen then is the um, if, if we have a level of LDL in the circulation, basically what happens is cells are presented with a load of LDL that exceeds the capacity of the receptor to clear that mm-hmm. cholesterol out of the circulation. So this is where the LDL receptor becomes saturated. And the LDL receptor becomes saturated at these levels that we were talking about earlier that are just sufficient for bodily function. Over about a circulating level of about six milligrams, the LDL receptor can become saturated, right? So the the levels, again, this ties to the fact that our physiological maximum for requirements appears to be about 30 milligrams or in that range of up to 30 milligrams per deciliter. But once the LDL receptor becomes saturated, it basically, um, you know, it, 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 that capacity mm. to then clear that right. circulate, that LD, that cholesterol from the LDL in circulation mm. is diminished. It's kind of like a crane on the dock. The crane's the receptor. And I love if those, this analogy. If those cranes, you thought about this. No. <laughs> no. I'm just, is this I'm, just coming yeah, this now. This is coming now. Great. The, those, I've this. got a friend who works on the docks and, okay. and, and drives, uh, steers a crane. Steers or drives? I'm not sure what mm. you'd say, but um, operates. And yeah, so that would be similar to that. Those the, There's just not enough crane activity to unload yeah. those mm-hmm. containers. Yeah. 
Yeah, basically. And you end up with them floating on the ships and eventually they have to go somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and so so this, this, this process is a kind of gradient or, or threshold dependent process in many respects. So, you know, we do need this cholesterol. And this, this is where they, they take this grain of truth and they twist it into something that sounds like it's something you want to question. Mm. Or it sounds like it's something that, you know, we're not being told the full story. But they're not the ones communicating the full story because they are correct. Anyone that says the body needs cholesterol is in point of fact correct. Mm -hmm. Anyone says that cholesterol is used for the synthesis of sex steroid Mm -hmm. hormones, right, is in point of fact correct. There isn't a single person in the cardiovascular sciences community that would deny any of this Mm because it's just a fact. What they're not telling you is what levels are sufficient in the Mm -hmm. body to actually have these mechanisms and have this cholesterol be used for these purposes. And those levels are far lower than anyone in that community even walking around right. with LDL. It's fans. a much more simplified story. Usually how it goes yeah. is someone you know, sends in a question, a Q&A on their story and says, hey, I went to the doctor, my LDL cholesterol is super high. They've told me to change my diet. And then their response is, no, well, actually you need cholesterol for your hormones. Yeah. So mm-hmm. don't worry about that yeah, advice. essential for life. <laughs> it's found in the brain, all this yeah. kind of thing. Um, and yeah, and speaking to that, it, it's not only that there's a, only a certain amount needed, it's that beyond that, there's no beneficial impact, mm-hmm. right? So their, their, their possible counterclaim of, oh, well, if this is good for uh, cell membranes or, or for the brain or something, well, the more it's going to be better. It's like, yeah, no, 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 like this, this Such amount is enough beyond that. an important thing in, in, that. in all in just nutrition science and science in general or human biology, exposure amount and threshold. Yeah. And understanding that something yeah. can be good and beneficial up to a point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And what happens here, you know, we have, again, where we're, where we're, where LDL is delivering this cholesterol to cells and we have that receptor take that cholesterol into cells, one of the, one of the net effects is that cell can downregulate its own cholesterol synthesis. It doesn't need to produce its own cholesterol. Um, and the point is, it's just to the point Danny just said about, you know, more isn't better for these reasons. So we can de- deposit cholesterol two cells and deliver it there. But in the absence of that, you know, a cell can synthesize its own cholesterol. So there, there's no, it, it synthesizes it in the amounts required. So this idea that having a higher level of LDL carrying cholesterol is some, it's not doing anything. Mm. It's not going anywhere. It's not being delivered anywhere. Mm-hmm. It's just in the circulation. And that's the problem. It's the mm. circulating gradient. And as that gradient increases, the risk of Such cardiovascular disease linearly increases. Such a good point, just yeah. to hammer that home. It's just not going anywhere. Right, because it's the claim in- is, well, you'll have better hormones or better no. uh, immunity. You know, Saladino no. often talks about yeah. better immunity. Yeah. So, the, I mean, look, the, the immunity thing is, I, 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 I've, I don't know. I've never actually seen it substantiated. No. I'm- I've seen it as this broad kind of claim. And one... One aspect, the, the one time I've seen any, any one of those offer a supporting reference or otherwise for it, what they've typically looked at is the relationship. For example, this happened during COVID. This study came out in, of a Chinese group and it said, ah, people hospitalized with COVID had low LDL. So they were relating that then to, right. to the immunity aspect. But we, we know, again, it's a point of fact that having a disease, being infected, causes, like, lo- leads to lowering of LDL mm. cholesterol, right? When cancer is developing, it influences lipoprotein metabolism. So the temporal relationships between mm. these factors that they're trying to associate really are important. So what's happening isn't that low LDL is making people more prone to infection from COVID or indeed causing cancer the LDL is lowering because they have a disease, because is, they are infected. Which is making them which susceptible is to reverse COVID. causality. <laughs> right. Uh-huh. So, and what, what, if you looked at that study, what happens is when they recovered from COVID, their LDL went back up. Right. Mm-hmm. 
So it's not a causal relationship at all. That also brings us to the longevity, sort of the the longevity claim mm. where some people will point to a certain cohort and say, well, if you if you look at this study, you know, folks with higher LDL cholesterol actually lived longer, they had lower risk of, of total mortality. Mm. Yeah. And, yeah. And this is the whole all cause mortality yeah. of, conundrum, right? And, and the importance of looking at what studies people are pointing to uh, and then looking at, okay, number one, where are we intervening? Kind of what's the, the age? And then within the follow up, are we accounting for the fact that there could be people undiagnosed with an illness at mm. the at the start of that, right? That hasn't been mm. uh, diagnosed yet, which would speak to this um, issue that Alan has raised about if you have then uh, an illness that develops that then leads to lower LDL cholesterol, then you're just kind of mm-hmm. misinterpreting what is actually going on. Mm-hmm. And so I think this gets wrapped up in that, that whole situation. And that's typically where people point to even if they accept the issue around atherosclerosis uh, risk, which they probably don't, but even at that point, then it quickly gets shifted to, mm-hmm. yeah, but what about all cause mortality? And then pointing to this, some of this stuff, which I think is largely explained by by some of those issues. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. Yeah, explain, explain one that, that pops up here. And I think this is... Um, speaks to like lifetime exposure and you just mentioned then like when do you intervene Mm -hmm. so one thing that i see come up is someone will say well i know someone who had low ldl cholesterol Mm -hmm. you know and they still had a heart attack Mm -hmm. so this person probably presumably in this anecdote um that person was put on you know statins or Mm -hmm. pcsk9 inhibitors they lowered their cholesterol they still had a heart attack Mm -hmm. now the kind of lay interpretation of that is, see, that's evidence that low cholesterol is not yeah. protecting you against a, an event. Can you kind of explain yeah. why this, that's not the this case? This actually goes back to, to the kind of the seminal uh, epidemiology that identifies total cholesterol as, as a risk factor, the Framingham, the original Framingham cohort in the late 40s and early 50s. And people liked to point to that and say, well... You know, 35% of the heart disease in that cohort occurred in people with normal cholesterol levels. Mm. But recall that concepts like normal, high, or low, don't they're abstract unless we put definitions on them. And we're the ones putting definitions on them. Low at the time, as in normal at the time, when people say 35% of heart disease in Framingham occurred in people with normal cholesterol was less than 200 milligrams total cholesterol. So when people say, oh, well, someone had low cholesterol or they were, they were put on this drug and still had a heart attack, it's highly likely that they, and, and what we tend to see is the attained level of LDL cholesterol really matters. So unless, and, and this is the reason, this is really important for people to grasp, again, unless those thresholds of, you know, less than 1.8 millimole per liter, 70 to 80 milligrams per deciliter are being reached, atherosclerosis can still progress. Now, the rate and the magnitude of that progression will be different, will vary relative to how high that is. Someone with an LDL of 200 milligrams, not not total, even just LDL of 200 milligrams, say, or over 160, 180. Someone with an LDL that high will will have a a higher, faster rate of progression than someone with an LDL of, say, 140 gotcha. or 130. Mm. So the time course that that both of those individuals, you know, take to reach their first cardiovascular event might differ. But what we typically see is that kind of claim of well someone had normal LDL cholesterol and they still had a heart attack. Within our current definitions, normal may not actually be quite yet defined in a, at a threshold that's sufficient to actually offset the mm-hmm. rate, the, the, the progression altogether. Yeah. Yeah. You, you see a similar thing with the statin denialism, mm. right? And something we've covered of Asim Malhotra is a really good example of this talking about, look, you give people statins and it actually doesn't do anything for their risk, right? Mm-hmm. They still have events or there's still mortality. And again, by and large, when you look at any evidence they try and cite there, it's where you've had this late uh, prescription mm-hmm. of, of statins. Mm-hmm. So you, if you give start giving someone uh, statins in their 70s, for example, and they have an event off, off the back of that uh, a number of years later, then you've had decades 
worth of plaque progression potentially mm. for that individual. And so then lowering their LDL in their 70s mm-hmm. and then seeing that, oh, they still had a cardiovascular event, therefore mm. statins don't do anything mm. is, is, is misleading. Because again, it's this lifetime cumulative exposure. So this is why early intervention is very important. I mean, this is where right. you see some people on Twitter joke that statins should be put in the water in, supply. In the water right? supply. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But also there's, a, and, and I appreciate you probably haven't read the full study yet, but we were flicking around a study a couple of days ago, I think the Fourier. The Fourier yeah, right. And that kind we're of also speaks this. to this, yeah. right? Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's, 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 it's incredible, I think, to see. And I, I you know, haven't read the full study yet. Saw the, the, the slides mm-hmm. shared from the EAS um, Congress. And I think... Uh, I think the implications are are kind of profound for a couple of reasons. There's been a lot of people in the cardiovascular space, and and it has been debated, it hasn't been a settled kind of question at all, but there has been a general kind of, in terms of the overall interpretation of the evidence, move towards the idea that not only is, is lower better, for cardiovascular disease, for, for for avoiding the development of atherosclerosis or indeed getting it to a level where if someone does have a degree of plaque, that that can actually regress because their LDL is kept in a range where the escaping of, of LDL from the bloodstream is controlled. But within the lower is better, there was always, there was as well an earlier is better. So lower, earlier would be the best, so to speak. But actually, that evidence was was largely based on an inference of of, of a couple of strands of evidence. Um, Brian Ferentz's genetic studies. So you take people that have genetic variants in PCSK9 gene; they have the lowest lifetime cardiovascular risk. Their cholesterol levels are are, are low from the from the from the womb. Lucky. Um, you've got people with variants in HMG CoA reductase and um, NLCP1L1. Uh, which is um, what ezetimibe targets. It's a um, in the gut receptor that controls uh, the absorption of cholesterol from diet. So you look at any of the, those variants; they all lower cardiovascular disease over the course of a lifetime to various magnitudes, and those magnitudes relate to how much lower there an individual that with that variance LDL cholesterol is. So that was looking at genetic studies, going okay. When people when we when we compared you know, the the genetic studies, the lifelong exposure to lower LDL levels, there was a 55% lower risk of cardiovascular disease. So that was one strand of evidence. And then, of course, you have the population studies where when you stratified for age, like Danny just mentioned, like the average um, baseline age of people in statin interventions is 63. So they're often older. And, And indeed, you have trials where people are in their 70s when treatment is initiated, atherosclerosis is already advanced. Yeah, you put them on a statin. Yeah, they still have a heart disease, you know, endpoint or a cardiovascular disease endpoint because they're just diseased and older. But when you stratify the population blood cholesterol studies into decades of life, what you saw was that in the 40 to 50 age group, for example, those with lower cholesterol had, had significant, the steep of how lower their risk was, was much uh, greater than in the 60 to 70 age bracket, mm-hmm. right? So you'd much lower risk when you'd low cholesterol in that life stage. But direct interventions hadn't really um, kind of provided anything to the to to that question necessarily in a way that in a way that this recent publication has because it's it's in terms of what they've done, you've given what they did was a secondary prevention trial where people were already on a maximally, to- maximally tolerated dose of statins, and they were administered a PCSK9 inhibitor in the Fourier trial to get that LDL even lower. And Fourier was the trial I mentioned earlier that pre-specified how low can, how low can we get people safely, down to six milligrams. Um, and the intervention itself lasted two years, and then after the intervention, because the actual treatment was so successful, the placebo group were then given the PCSK9 inhibitor their LDL drops to basically 30 milligrams per deciliter and they do get a significant reduction in risk of a further event. But what's most profound as a finding from this trial is the difference in risk between the timing of initiation, 
between the treatment group and the placebo group, the difference in two years of lowering LDL um, being much more significant in the actual original intervention group. Mm. And and so this is, although a secondary analysis and although not necessarily run, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of follow-up period of a randomized control trial. I, I think it's added a really, really strong and convincing piece of evidence that actually the lower we're intervening in people to get LDL lower, the better. Mm. Now, the question here, of course, is, this is a second The earlier we intervene. Yeah, yeah. the earlier we intervene mm-hmm. in life mm-hmm. and get LDL to ranges where atherosclerosis cannot progress, the better. Right. Now, I think we do have to remember that Fourier, just to put it in its right context, is a secondary prevention trial. Mm. So what would be really interesting now is mm. to see this in a primary prevention context. Right. Um, nevertheless, when we're thinking about the available converging lines of evidence from genetic studies to epidemiology to some of the, some of the evidence coming out of RCTs in terms of earlier, you know, the earlier in li- in someone's life stage that they can get LDL lower, the better as far as their long-term cardiovascular risk. I think there's going to be so many interesting questions in clinical practice going forward. I think uh, over lunch we chatted about some of these other day where uh, now conceivably this might be one of the areas where there might be conversations between uh, clinicians and physicians of saying, okay, bef- even before we pass a threshold for disease or pre-disease for someone, we might just need to intervene mm-hmm. pharmacologically uh, as opposed to go with kind of lifestyle modification for a while, see how things progress. If it gets worse, mm-hmm. then we'll intervene with, with drugs, which is how we would approach many other conditions, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. Well, this might be one where that, as as we start to see, becomes maybe right. untenable. Some people might think of, well, we just even... Ethically, yeah. Like, can we let people go, if we do this whole 10-year risk score... And we say, well, yeah, I know your, your LDL is 130, you know, maybe change your diet a little bit, but your your 10-year risk score is low. C- come back in a decade. Mm. We're, we're basically saying, go mm. away and allow atherosclerosis to progress for 10 years. Right. I think there's a big ethical question that will eventually have to be faced where delaying intervening in the causal pathway, it's different if someone has, a, you know, that's again. This comes back to this really important distinction between biomarkers. You know, if someone someone maybe had some high triglycerides, but their LDL wasn't particularly high, maybe some. You know, you, you can address those with slightly more leeway in time, mm. in terms of time. But I, I think now there there is there's a big question in terms of if, if we've got people with any sort of LDL cholesterol level that's in this range where atherosclerosis can progress, is kicking the can down the road by a decade. Right, you particularly know, if someone's say like twenty twenty five, right. and you're only looking out to when yeah. they're thirty thirty five, <laughs> yeah, yeah. um, you know, ideally that person is is made aware of what their risk is when they're mm. forty and right. at fifty. Yeah, yeah. Um, they've still got a lot of life to to live. We can jab kids with PCSK9 inhibitors. Yeah, That's, well, I had seen uh, something recently. Uh, it's a group uh, that are looking at gene editing of the... Of yeah, the, yeah, yeah, we yeah, talked about yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's so cool. Yeah, Explain yeah. that for folks just in a, a sort of... Uh, so P- PCSK9 is is a gene. Um, and again, we've, we've mentioned a couple of times PCSK9 inhibitors. Um, it's a fairly awkward term to get out relative to something like statin. But mm. this is a class of drugs. They're injectable. And basically what they do is they they kind of inhibit the expression of this PCSK9 gene, which ultimately comes back to the LDL receptor that we were we were discussing. So PCSK9, uh, when it's active and expressed, uh, down-regulates the expression of the LDL receptor. So we don't have this level of cholesterol clearance from the blood. So if you inhibit with a drug or indeed with gene editing, essentially mm-hmm. knock out... PCSK9, what you're doing is having a big upregulation mm-hmm. of the expression of the LDL receptor. Mm-hmm. More cranes clearing cholesterol from the blood. Right. And of the three major class of drugs that are available for lowering LDL, we've got statins, which inhibit HMG-CoA reductase, which is an enzyme in the pathway of liver synthesis of LDL. So by inhibiting that step, you're lowering the synthesis of LDL in the liver. And then we have ezetimibe, which is a, a bile acid sequestrant. Essentially, ezetimibe acts on another, on, on kind of cholesterol absorption in the gut. 
um, again, lowering liver synthesis and increasing LDL receptor expression. Statins increase the expression of the LDL receptor in the liver and PCSK9. So although they're targeting different pathways, the gut, HMG-CoA reductase, PCSK9, the unifying final pathway that makes all of these drugs work is they all act by upregulating the expression of the LDL receptor. They all act by making more cranes mm -hmm. in the harbor clear the cholesterol from, from the ship, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And that is why the LDL receptor and this, and this, this we can say that this is the causal pathway because there's this unifying final mm -hmm. step between each of these drugs, even though the drugs themselves target different pathways. So with the promise of gene editing, you could really target the pathway that has the most profound impact on lowering cholesterol, LDL cholesterol in the blood. Um, and again, you know, the potential for that to be almost as part of like a vaccination schedule or something, mm. you know. I think we're on the cusp of, of a revolution mm. in eliminating, hopefully, right. the, the burden of atherosclerotic yeah. cardiovascular disease from the population. And, and this is why the likes of, of, of Paul Saladino and otherwise are just, um, just, just thorns in the side of scientific progress. Mm. What would um, that do to lifespan? Uh, or, or is it more of a health span consideration? Like, would would that change the average lifespan? Do you think? I don't know because I think we're this conversation. We're very focused on atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. We have so many other issues in society, social and economic and environmental and otherwise that that are influencing life expectancy. You know, in the in the UK, we've seen life expectancy in the what they call the periphery basically the areas outside of london start to decline um and there, there's a burden of ill health involved that extends beyond just cardiovascular disease mm -hmm. so i think that this would be specific to cardiovascular disease what impact it would translate to as far as life expectancy i think that becomes part of this overall kind of soup that we have of, of, mm -hmm. of all these other factors and metabolic disease is still a major issue, obviously, in the population and, and these other kinds of, um, you know, determinants, social and environmental mm -hmm. and economic determinants of health are influencing life expectancy. So I think it would be kind of hard to, mm -hmm. but it's certainly, certainly the health span of individuals would, would hopefully not be one where they're facing a coronary event right. mm. or the surgeries and interventions required and, you know, uh, yeah, stroke, these other... You'd, I guess you'd hate to see that come in and for folks who could change their diet in some ways, in, in ways that would be meaningful for their overall health, mm. decide not to make changes. Mm. Um, but then there's going to be a, a, a whole host of people that could... Uh, access that type of intervention who are just aren't in the position to to make changes yeah mm -hmm. so that's that becomes the question i mean you, someone could then conceivably not develop atherosclerosis but could easily develop fatty liver and mm -hmm. diabetes you know yeah. it's like um talk to me about veins mm. this one <laughs> seems to be a, a new one that's that's sort of popped up and and the idea is that okay alan danny if the, there's a threshold whereby uh, you have a, a certain number of these ApoB containing lipoproteins, mm -hmm. which then um, uh, essentially gets you to a tipping point where you start to get accumulation within the uh, wall of the artery mm -hmm. at this this fatty plaque buildup, which ultimately leads to some sort of obstruction and an and event. If that's the case, presumably arteries and veins in the body are exposed to the same number of ApoB containing lipoproteins. Why do we uh, not see atherosclerosis in veins and why are we seeing it show up just in arteries? Yeah, so so there's well there's a couple of things. So one is is, you know, it's 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 carried in it's carried in the plasma, right? Lipoproteins are carried in plasma in veins. There's a range of, there's, a, there's a number of levels. One is that within the plasma, there are other factors that are present um, that can have protective effects uh, that 
those protective effects are lost once kind of trapped and retained in the artery. But m mainly it's to do with the fact that within, we're, we're talking about kind of the spilling, when, we, when we're talking about, well, LDL, you know, gets into the artery wall, we're talking about the kind of spillover uh, of the plasma into that space, right? So the 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 atherosclerosis, like the processes involved, the ApoB moiety binding to these proteoglycans in the artery wall, like those those processes don't occur in the plasma. Um, their retention, the subsequent inflammatory and immune processes occur with that retention, and that retention doesn't occur in the plasma. Um, so it's it's just it's just a fundamental distinction in relation to the actual mechanisms involved in atherosclerosis relative to the um, particular circulatory site that we're that we're looking at. So I, I think that that's an interesting one because I think to an, to a listener that sounds really plausible, uh, mm -hmm. or at least it sounds like a kind of like question to answer. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Why why does it develop in? in the arteries, but it's, it's to do with that, um, with that manner of its, of, of LDL circulation and, and the spillover then of, of, of plasma containing LDL, um, into the artery and the, and the fact that those processes are processes that occur from that, that initial retention. Mm. So the penetration is obviously a factor, but really what, what, what it is, is that the, the net retention of, that particle in the artery wall and those processes don't occur um, don't occur in veins necessarily. Is there something even within the arterial system that makes certain spots susceptible? Um, I haven't looked at this, but it seems like you know the the arteries you know feeding the 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 heart and then also the brain. There, there seems like there's certain spots where it's more likely for this to be to become an issue. Yeah, there, there, there do appear to be spots that are sensitive to the um, to the actual process of retention, specific sites within the arterial intima specifically. Um, the processes that then occur in response to that, so let's say we then have the mounting of immune and inflammatory responses occur without the, you know, and, and kind of with the p potential for protective compounds like vitamin E essentially um, kind of nullified. Um, and so oxidation uh, of that particle that has been trapped um, occurs in, in ways that may be specific to the site of binding and the site mm -hmm. of retention. Um, the nature of the actual buildup of the, of the atheroma, of the atheroma in, that, in that artery itself um, and the kind of processes that result in these immune cells obviously migrating to this site and then, you know, basically getting stuck and it all kind of forming part of these kind of fatty streaks and, and, and the nature of the actual injury in the artery wall itself. So there, there does seem to be something about mm. the actual site of yeah. binding and retention and, and, the, and, the, and the characteristics of that, you know, mm. binding site that do and make the processes that occur subsequently to that retention um, what they are as mm. far as... Would it be fair to say that not all of the mechanisms in pathophysiology is fully understood and that there's still science to be conducted there, but, but that level of uncertainty doesn't refute the evidence and the studies that we have showing earlier intervention, getting ApoB containing lipoproteins down leads to better health outcomes. Could those two things both exist? Like, is that, is that sort of a, a, a fair comment? They, they do exist. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the first consensus statement from the EAS was on causality of LDL. And it was synthesizing genetic studies, epidemiology, randomized control trials, the, the totality of evidence that we have to support that this risk factor is, is the causal pathway of atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. The second statement, which Jan Boren led was published three years later. So the first statement was 2017, and then 2020, they published um, a second statement, which was much more focused on the mechanisms um, of 
you know, transcytosis, exocytosis, all of these kind of really nitty gritty detailed processes. And that statement does contain a lot of reference to the 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 kind of unknowns at this point, or the things we think might be a factor but need further research. And I, I think that there's it's it's so clear when you look at the actual area of cardiovascular science, the people conducting this research, that yeah, of course, there's so much that can still be uh, and that is yet to be uncovered. But that's getting at this kind of like nitty gritty kind of mechanistic and pathophysiology level. None of those open questions and further research negates the fact that we have more than sufficient evidence Mm. to declare LDL itself as the causal biomarker and causal pathway. Um, And again, people manipulate what having kind of further research to do and open Mm. questions means Mm. um, in terms of its kind of practical application. Yeah, it it mirrors something I'm sure we'll talk about when we get on to some dietary stuff. You see a similar issue there where over time there are things that are unknown that Mm -hmm. more mechanistic work actually leads us to refine our understanding of how diet is implicated Mm -hmm. here. That doesn't necessarily mean that initial observations of certain ways of eating or certain dietary patterns can say raise your LDL cholesterol. It doesn't throw any of that out, mm-hmm. but it now refines our understanding of, well, what components was driving that? Uh, why is there a difference maybe between mm-hmm. individual response? All these other things that then can be targeted for future mm-hmm. uh, research and future interventions. So it's a, it's a refinement of understanding as opposed to, oh, it, it's going to like negate everything right. else that has come before, particularly at where we're at with mm-hmm. uh, LDL, ABOB, mm-hmm. and cardiovascular disease. It's just, it's beyond, uh, it's beyond anything close to mm-hmm. speculative yeah. at this point. It's, yeah. it's, it's settled to, to a degree where now we're just looking at how do we fill in those gaps mm-hmm. mechanistically. Mm-hmm. You can tell Danny has done his fair share of, of hosting. He knows the flow better than me. Um, <laughs> But it's a nice segue into diet because um, we need to make sure that we... Well, we, if not here for diet, then we, yeah. <laughs> we shouldn't be here. Right. Um, but you... So this, I guess when, when we talk about diet and what someone can do to, let's say, lower their ApoB um, levels, um, there's kind of two things that I, I want to uh, speak to here. One is you mentioned Dave Feldman and I know that you guys interviewed him and I think it would be instructive to learn kind of what you... Um, took away from that where you where your position is with regards to this lean mass hyper responder type um, I guess uh, theory or construct that that um, Dave Feldman has put together and seemingly uh, a number of people online are sort of following mm-hmm. um, and um, as an extension of that if someone's following a sort of ketogenic diet um, and enjoying that style of, of high fat diet, what are some modifications they could potentially entertain mm. that could um, shift their ApoB into a more favorable direction? And then we can just, um, you know, talk outside of that, just diet in general for someone who's not following a ketogenic diet. What are the, the, the sort of main principles or um, characteristics of a diet that they could consider? So let's start with Dave Feldman. In terms of his lipid triad and yeah, and just like you, you guys had him on. You sat down and, yeah. and you you interviewed him and you listened to what he had to say. He's a prominent figure, um, yeah. I guess, in that sort of low carb ketogenic world. Mm-hmm. I see him as someone that a lot of people um, kind of look up to. He seems yes. sort of he presents as very level headed and with good intentions. And to me, he symbolizes for for many people he is doing work and his theory is a way for them to kind of justify where they've landed. Yes. You know, they've, 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 they've turned their health around a lot of times, lost a lot of weight, but mm-hmm. they've gone to their doctor and their APOB and their is, is super yeah, high. Their LDL is through right? the roof. Yeah. Dave Feldman offers an explanation yes, he does. that Western medicine, the doctor is not providing. Yeah. And it's, it's a explanation or it's kind of like just asking questions mm-hmm. um, that, oh, hang on. You might have high uh, LDL cholesterol, um, but given your other factors that are here, it, it may not be an issue. Yeah, um, I think you know. I think you know. He he has crafted obviously a, a, a reputation um, and a kind of position for himself as being you know the the guy in a, in a community of a lot of actual crazies 
that you know is is kind of reasonable or is is just asking questions and is kind of open to the conversation and you know has this kind of rhetoric of you know willing to be wrong happy to be wrong um and really what my my kind of sense of it you know from from that process is he has no interest in in any of that uh, i don't think he has any interest in being wrong i think he's convinced he's right i think all of that portrayal is is a ruse essentially to um make it seem like this is all kind of fair game uh you know all up for debate what was instructive we we talked a little bit about this last night what what said everything to me was when again he was in the UK to do this kind of documentary and and so the guy is is an engineering background so he's he's no I mean, it's not a scientific background in the kind of biomedical biosciences sense and so you would think if you're really interested in getting getting to the bottom of this stuff you're you're reading you know the 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 kind of the the literature so to speak you know and that, and from the people producing the science and i i couldn't I was I was so taken by the fact that some of the most important seminal researchers in this area, the people who have produced some of the most convincing evidence for this, and he had no idea who they were. So that that really spoke to me that actually this kind of oh I'm I'm really you know I'm I'm kind of I'm here to really get to the bottom of this and learn. It's like not not really you know I think he has his ideas and he's running with them um, under this kind of on under this kind of facade of hey i'm i'm here this is all just kind of legitimate open questions particularly where where we have the body of evidence that we do he he's a couple of kind of major claims one is that well if people go low carb and particularly if they're starting from a place of not being particularly healthy uh you know maybe central adiposity overweight this kind of thing they'll have that combination we talked about of they'll have they'll have kind of high ldl but it'll be small smaller dense ldl They'll have high triglycerides, they'll have low HDL, and then they'll go on a low-carb or ketogenic diet, and they'll see this reverse. They'll see their LDL won't go anywhere. <laughs> It'll stay high, probably go higher, but their HDL will go up and their triglycerides will go down. And they'll say, this is a good thing. This is actually what we want. And then they'll go further and they'll make claims like, well, actually, in the context of this type of picture, LDL isn't a problem they'll talk about insulin resistance and otherwise um and they'll 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 talk about inflammation as well but yeah again inflammation um if in the in the context of someone who has this high ldl phenotype or the lipid triad as they call it well if their inflammation is low again that adds to the high hdl low triglycerides low inflammation that's fine we don't need to worry about ldl in that context and just to be clear when you say high ldl we're talking like on par with someone with genetically high? We're, we're often, yeah, depending on someone's diet. And indeed, there is a large spectrum of indif- inter-individual responsiveness to, to diet and cholesterol. But it can certainly get to ranges that you would see with genetic conditions like familial mm. hypercholesterolemia, um, which if left untreated can can have people have a coronary event as, as early as their kind of mid-30s, you know. So... And there's a number of claims that are made in response to this. And again, they, they all fall back on the fact that th- what they're offering as what they think is a claim or a contrary stance on the evidence or, or a piece of evidence that, oh, well, it can't be LDL because of this other evidence is simply just a part of the overall evidence base that exists. Like we discussed the inflammation thing earlier. It's It's not... It's not an independent causal pathway. It's a systemic biomarker that is important if someone has both high LDL Mm. and high inflammation. But lowering LDL will lower that person's risk independent of inflammation. Um, And they just have a lot of contradictory perspectives on all of this. Like Danny mentioned earlier, the Framingham Offspring Study, which even if that's their claim, and they rely on that study a lot, it's clear in that data (laughs) that... If you had the phenotype of high LD, of of high triglycerides and sorry low triglycerides and high HDL, having lower cholesterol was preferable yeah. and associated with a lower risk than higher cholesterol in that cohort. And ultimately, they're they're totally dismissive of or refuse to engage with some of the most 
slam dunk aspects of this mm. evidence base, like the genetic studies um, that Ferenc conducted, or or the the correlation in terms of risk reduction between the interventions to lower cholesterol and what was predicted from genetic right. studies per say one millimole lower or thirty eight mm. milligram lower. LDL level, what would be predicted from genetic studies as a risk reduction relative to a similar magnitude of achieved LDL reduction from azetamibe or statin? Right. They stack up. Mm. You can take any genetic variant you want, which will all influence how lower someone's LDL cholesterol is to different degrees. But when you standardize all of those variants per 10 milligram reduction in LDL, they all lead to the pretty much exact same risk reduction. So it's the it's the causal pathway. They don't agree or they don't just seem to deal with the Mendelian randomization genetic studies what, at all. What's, do you think it's because they just enjoy that diet and, and eating that way um, or is it because they they lost some weight and they're just trying to find a way to kind of um, substantiate this as being completely healthy? Because it seems like to me the more pragmatic way, I'd love people to change their diet, but the more rational sort of logical pragmatic way would be to say you know what i've i've lost lots of weight i'm feeling better mm. my hdl and triglycerides have moved in the right direction i'm going to keep doing this but i'll supplement it with a pcsk9 inhibitor or a statin yeah right. it'd be nice to see people be that pragmatic but it, it, I, and i mean I, I can't really speak to the psychological intricacies involved i'm sure behavioral scientists would have a, mm. a field day looking at this but um there, because there could be many things involved of why people choose to row in behind a certain narrative like that. I think part of it is because often when they've experienced that success, it's been predicated on hearing that here is a different approach. This is different to what you've been told before. Maybe you've even been lied to before. And so when they see success on that, then of mm -hmm. course it's like, well, well, everything else then was a lie, right? right. So. Um, there, it builds in a distrust of previous information they maybe have came across. And yeah, I don't know, on an, on an individual for someone, I think there's something nice about thinking there's no problem. Um, mm -hmm. Then in terms of people who perpetuate mm -hmm. the idea, there's, an, there's another set of incentives that are at play there, especially once you have this almost reinforcing loop of people praising you for, for work you do and for uh, maybe telling you very positive anecdotes of how it's helped them. And that community you've now built is predicated on not accepting some of these things mm -hmm. that, that you've previously denied. So yeah. there's a whole set of things involved. And I don't want to presume it's always with malice intention. I think right. sometimes a lot of this is subconsciously, it, it mm -hmm. may feed into uh, incentives that are important to humans. Uh, but certainly uh, like the, the thing I find most difficult to to accept is that there seems to be a willingness to dismiss any of the LDL uh, evidence on the basis that it doesn't apply to this specific population. Mm -hmm. So anything you can show, unless this is in people with this specific type of phenotype, mm -hmm. this high HDL, uh, low triglycerides that are on a low carbohydrate diet, unless it's them, then suddenly there's this idea that evidence becomes invalid, mm -hmm. which is, is nonsensical, yes. right? Or, or in the same way, we don't want to look at the genetic data because that doesn't apply here. Yeah. Um, or we don't want to look at the drug trials. So now you have purposely created a vacuum of what you can actually look at. Mm. And so then you are relegated yeah. to maybe some stratifications of some of this mm. observational data. Although they'll dismiss every other piece of observational data exists. <laughs> and, and I mean, I, we've seen it online recently, right? All the fervor in that, in, in that community around the early presentation mm. at a conference of mm. data from essentially a kind of exploratory pilot investigation, yeah. even at that, mm. is is met with so much more um, appreciation or being groundbreaking, right. which it can't be by, by definition, uh, versus any That's other That's confirmation big data. bias. Yeah. 100%. It's being yeah. accepted without being skeptical of the nature of the, mm -hmm. the right. investigation, yeah. whereas there's complete skepticism towards all these other yeah. more rigorous... I mean, we just talked about the follow-up for the Fourier trial and l literally groundbreaking results. Yeah. Like that could change the course of cardiovascular mm. medicine, potentially, or at least feed into, feed into that. And you probably won't hear any of that right. discussed. Yeah. yeah. I just hope there's... There's a bunch of people who are listening and are keeping their 
their minds open. Maybe that will change. Um, consider some of the, the different drugs or consider modifying their diet. So from, from that perspective, if someone's listening mm. and they've been in that community, things are going well, lost some weight, enjoying the, the keto diet, APOB is high, listening to what you guys have to say, they actually want to act on that, mm -hmm. make some dietary modifications. What are they doing within the keto framework? Yeah. So the, 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 the simplest, so they're, they're enjoying essentially a, a high fat diet. Mm -hmm. Um, that doesn't necessarily have to be, of course, absent all carbohydrates. And there's there's two kind of modifications within that dietary pattern that, that would, would really be the most efficacious that they would kind of almost have to do. One is, and the top line is modifying the, the composition of fat in their diet. So that, again, by all means, consume your 60 or 70% of your energy from fat. But that fat should primarily be unsaturated fats from plants and maybe marine sources. So uh, I'm presuming, again, someone following a ketogenic diet probably is consuming animal sources. Mm -hmm. So we would say plant and marine sources for their unsaturated fat intake and keeping their saturated fat intake to where we kind of generally recommend for population health. And, that, and that's not a threshold that's licked off the ground and people in that community will love to denigrate the evidence, although they don't really seem to understand it at all. Um, the reality is it's not just epidemiology that our recommendations for saturated fat are based on. We have intervention trials, large-scale intervention trials that support that 10% threshold. That's where we see the biggest drop-off in cardiovascular events from dietary fat intake, from saturated fat intake. So there's no reason why they can't have a high fat diet, but they should still be following those kind of general best practices for fat composition in their diet. Right. And so that will naturally occur by eating less what and more of what. Yeah, I mean, they'd want to be obviously probably selecting for kind of leaner sources of meat, maybe non-fat dairy sources, because they're going to be consuming a lot, I imagine, of animal produce generally. Mm -hmm. So maybe maybe opting for kind of non-fat or low-fat, you know, kind of high-protein style yogurts or um, opting for maybe more white meat compared to red meat or um, even opting for fish over, over some of their red meat as well. So it's just overall reducing that and, and, and not, you know, kind of having a, a pedestal on foods like coconut oil and treating it like a panacea. And then I think as well, secondarily, and, and this would obviously be through fat sources as well, would be really trying to also pay attention to their dietary fiber intake. And obviously they would be emphasizing different foods to someone following a slightly less restrictive diet and, you know, avocado, chia seeds, flax seeds, these kind of foods to help actually maintain fiber adequacy. Mm -hmm. uh, and both of those steps, I think, in terms mm -hmm. of modifying fat composition and really paying attention to their sources of fiber that would suit a diet like that to try and maintain fiber adequacy. And mm -hmm. I think those two would be the most important steps they could take to try and help lower their cholesterol, factoring in that it may not necessarily come down to levels, you know, that that might be more optimal. Right. Yeah. Which they would need to... to Take a drug on top of. Right. Yeah. yeah. Or or change their diet or to something stop. that yeah, exactly. has less total fat. Right? Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, one of the things that you see sometimes in the, that, that community is, is at least some of the people in that area are actually advocating for more saturated fat. And like, mm -hmm. it's actually, you have to like purposely, like we were talking about earlier, unless you are eating a lot of ultra processed foods, you have to like purposely target high saturated fat foods yeah. to get to mm -hmm. the level some of these people are consuming. Yeah. So purposely going for fatty cuts of meat um, uh, and so on. So th those changes, uh, and to kind of echo what Alan said, are mm -hmm. if you do want to go with a low carbohydrate, high fat intake, you can simply say, okay, for my meat intake, let me go for lower fat uh, or cuts of meat that are leaner with less fat um, and then not be doing things like purposely drinking down lots of butter and coconut mm -hmm. oil to jack up your fat intake mm -hmm. thinking that this is helping your mm -hmm. hormone production or whatever and then relying on plant sources of fat mm. is probably the easiest heuristic for people mm. right avocados nuts seeds olive oil um, olive oil, olive oil. Um, like right. you, you can get a good fat intake from those that are, mm. and then by nature, those things tend to be part of healthy meals, right? right. So where are you going to get 
extra virgin olive oil, where you're going to be adding it probably to a salad with lots of fibrous vegetables, which I think people forget can be part mm. of a the ketogenic diet. Stuff, you, know, a lot, yeah. you can get a lot of fibrous mm. vegetables there. Putting some olive oil, throw walnuts on it, have it with a piece of salmon. Mm -hmm. uh, like there's a lot you can do where you can actually have a really healthy dietary mm -hmm. pattern that ends up being high Sort in of fat. a more of a kind of Mediterranean keto diet in many ways. Right, yeah. Yeah, and, and then you can eat within a framework that is very similar to a Mediterranean diet, which mm -hmm. you have a ton of evidence for, and still have the benefit that for that individual that they get from being low in, in total carbohydrate. Yeah. So just to, it's probably from a standard Mediterranean diet, a little bit less whole grains or no whole grains and more non-starchy veg and mm -hmm. a bit right. more fat. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, there's probably even foods like butternut squash, which because of their actual kind of both fiber to kind mm -hmm. of usable net carbohydrate ratio could actually be included in a diet like that without mm -hmm. kicking their total carbohydrate intake. Mm-hmm. You know, over what what kind of thresholds they'd be trying to maintain. Um, Have you looked at MCT oil? Because I know a lot, a lot of people put butter in their coffee, and um, I was getting asked a lot about MCT oil. And I was interested: does it have what, what sort of effect does it have on on lipids? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't seem to have or be as deleterious as say no. pure coconut oil mm -hmm. or butter. Well, coconut oil is a mixed fatty acid composition. So the MCT oil that people kind of buy in shops is typically an eight mm -hmm. carbon caprylic acid. Right. And the chain length of a fatty acid, of a saturated fatty acid, of a fatty acid generally is, this is, this is what distinguishes the effects of saturated and unsaturated fats on blood cholesterol levels is the degree of saturation of the fatty acids. So for fully saturated fatty acids, there's also individual fatty acids do have kind of differential effects. And so those, you know, medium chain, something with, with, with that kind of short carbon length ultimately um, are just metabolized in a slightly different way where they're, where they're, they're oxidized um, in the liver. And it's these kind of longer chain fatty acids of say 12, 16, 18 carbon, maybe even the 18 carbon length has slightly lesser effect, but certainly in that kind of range of you know, 10, 12 to 16, where you see this cholesterol raising effect of saturated fatty acids. And the reason is to do, again, with the LDL receptor. So these types of fatty acids um, basically impact on when they're passing kind of through the liver, they downregulate activity of the LDL receptor. Uh, and so in turn, that's the mechanism by which, you know, dietary saturated fats then lead to increased LDL cholesterol because those LDL receptors are not clearing, like we mm -hmm. discussed before, that LDL from those lipoproteins and out of the circulation. And unsaturated fats have the opposite effects. And it seems to relate to, again, their degree of unsaturation. So polyunsaturated fats have the greatest effect on um, increasing LDL receptor expression and um, they, they, they influence a range actually of, of postprandial fat metabolism factors that ultimately lead to a better um, postprandial uh, state of fat metabolism. But the most important ratio uh, with the, within the context of dietary fat influencing um, circulating cholesterol levels is the relationship between saturated and polyunsaturated fat. And, and this is one of this is probably one of the most robust findings of the impact of diet on any physiological processes. It goes back 70 years. It's the tightest control of studies that we have. They're metabolic ward studies, controlling energy intake, um, maintenance energy intake, manipulating only the source and type of fat in the diet. Um, but, but the reason why we want way more unsaturated fat than we do saturated fat is because saturated fats impact on blood cholesterol and LDL cholesterol is twice that of the cholesterol lowering effect of polyunsaturated mm -hmm. fats. So this is why we want this particular balance where, you know, the vast majority, you know, three quarters almost of your total oh. fat intake should should ideally be unsaturated fats of a mix of kind of mono and, and polyunsaturated this is, fats. This is a really interesting point. And I think so now switching to like the plant-based community where mm -hmm. often there's a message of just total fat reduction yeah right which is and it's that message comes from a, a, a sort of a background of 
research and I know you've covered it looking at car- like considering mm. cardiovascular mm. disease. So mm-hmm. people have this idea that, oh, for heart health, I should just lower total fat. Mm-hmm. Um, so it might be a, a kind of the first time that someone's hearing this um, yeah. idea that no polyunsaturated fats, fats actually have a cholesterol lowering mm-hmm. effect. Yeah, the, the total fat content of the diet really is a secondary factor to the composition of fat within it. Um, and yes, those there is this kind of handful of terrible studies that <laughs> remain to be... Uh, and I think the plant-based community and, and, and people within the plant-based community and, and you and others have done a really good job of of making it clear to people that, you know, that kind of the Ornish Esselstein kind of research really is it's not good science. They're not reliable conclusions and we really shouldn't be. And, and they're all, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of at this point, they've, they haven't really been kind of replicated. And there's, there's very little within that evidence base to justify the 10% threshold for total fat. Even other interventions, you know, the, the broad study and you know, these other trials that have tried to get people to this threshold, often as well, what's interesting is they largely fail if it's a free living mm-hmm. intervention. Yeah. People kind of bottom out at like 17%. Mm-hmm. So, but just as a justification, there's, there's almost little to no evidential justification for trying to get dietary fat to that threshold. And I think for people following a uh, an exclusively plant-based diet, I think it makes the diet pretty miserable and unnecessarily mm. restrictive because sources of fat in the diet from a plant-based perspective are foods that really can make it, you know, olives, olive oil, mm. you know, nuts, seeds. They're really what kind of can enhance the quality of a dietary pattern in an exclusively plant-based context from the kind of additional nutrients to to fiber to to polyphenols and mm. olive oil and otherwise. So I, I think I find it both at the level of evidence and just putting our nutrition hats on, right. I, I find it a really difficult no. justification yeah. um, and, and one that I just don't see any real reason or recommendation for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's comforting news for for people because yeah. there's, a, there's a fair bit of fear. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, and it can be quite pragmatic, right? It's not to say that, uh, someone now needs to focus on how do I get my polyunsaturated fat yeah, as, high as, as, high as high as possible on my <laughs> yeah. plant-based diet, but rather like eating in line with those food-based mm-hmm. recommendations right. of this overall dietary pattern. And that's actually something I was thinking about when you mentioned the the MCT oil of even if we were to, to take that, okay, this doesn't have the same um, uh, LDL raising effect you could still say, well, why would someone conceivably want to stay eating their ketogenic diet and getting a huge contribution from MCT oil? First of all, you have a two, couple of pragmatic problems. One is the gastrointestinal distress can be pretty, yeah. pretty incredible from yeah. that. And then, and then secondly, the, the more of that you're consuming on the basis of, well, it's kind of a saturated fat, but it's not having this effect. It's like, but now you're having an isolated oil yes. outside of the context right. of food that you're now missing out on that mm-hmm. calorie and fat contribution from foods which have yeah. other nutrients There's an opportunity of benefit. cost. Right. Yeah. And the same thing here with uh, low fat. If you're avoiding olive oil because your total fat intake goes too high, well, now you're missing out on the polyphenols and other compounds in that. You're mm-hmm. missing out on the nuts and seeds that contain other types of phytosterols. So there's a whole, again, it comes back down to this dietary pattern issue, Mm -hmm. which we talk about because it's thinking of one food as one nutrient is misguided, right? Well, I think we've kind of basically summarized just for anyone um, through the saturated polyunsaturated fat point that you made and then also increasing fiber. Mm. I think think as well with the plant-based context, Similarly, you know, people don't want to go hog wild with coconut oil, no. <laughs> you know, because again, while while a while a while a kind of you know an eight carbon length MCT that's refined just to be that specific fatty acid essentially might not necessarily have the cholesterol raising effect of other saturated fats. That's not coconut oil. Coconut mm-hmm. oil is 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 a food matrix of saturated fatty acids, mm-hmm. and it does have a cholesterol it's mostly raising lauric effect. acid, isn't it? A lot of lauric, lauric acid. and caprylic, right. and um, yeah, so and, it does and, and jack up, and it does jack up cholesterol. Right. So again, and and none of this is in, none of this is necessarily. I think problem when you're starting to talk about diet is when everyone starts taking it to the extreme. Um, by all means, include coconut oil, but right. just don't be putting it in coffee or anything That's like right. this. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a difference between having like a little serve of coconut yogurt a day, yeah, and 
like Drew said, what he was doing at one stage. A jar of that coconut was when he was oil on the paleo, day. He was on the paleo yeah. diet. Yeah, 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 and for yeah. some reason, he thought it'd be a good yeah. idea to have a jar of coconut yeah. a day yeah. or a week or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, yeah. That'll send your apo. That's such a great story. story. Yeah. <laughs> and his mum's a GP and his mum's like, your cholesterol's yeah. gone through the roof because you're eating loads of saturated fat. And he was like, mum, that's old science. <laughs> oh, please. He said, that's yeah. old science. He said, he said, you need to look deeper. It's large, fluffy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. Uh, we all we all go through our hubris phase, you know. Gosh, I, was, well, I think we I did was it. there too. Yeah, I think we I think we did it, guys. Yeah, how do you feel? Is I there think. anything that we missed that you you wanted to add? As far as diet, no. I mean, I think I think the I think people will often uh, point to carbohydrates and say, well there's an increase in triglycerides. And this is a big narrative in the low carb community mm -hmm. as to why, you know, but, but we know particularly from, you know, James Anderson's research, it's actually, you know, the, the triglyceride raising effect of carbohydrate really relates to the type and the refinement and the fiber content of those carbohydrates. So, yeah. you know, the, the idea that kind of consuming whole grains or fiber rich legumes is, is going to be something that has that effect versus say mm -hmm. a lot of white rice or refined sources. Again, it's, it's something that just really, it may be a concern for someone with a high refined starch and sugar intake, but you know, for, mm. for a lot of listeners that are mm. going to be really looking at improving diet quality, it's just not going to be something that they need to worry mm. about. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would just say, again, we're talking about overall dietary patterns, which we know confer lower risk in, in terms of the fat, fatty acid composition. Alan mentioned this uh, hierarchy essentially if we're reducing saturated fat to the level that we aim for say typically less than 10 percent of calories you get more of an ldl lowering uh, impact from putting in more polyunsaturated fats then you have kind of monounsaturated fats uh complex carbohydrates mm -hmm. and then when you if you were to substitute it for uh, added sugars you don't see any risk reduction right so mm -hmm. you have this kind of hierarchy of what you're adding right. in now in place of the diet with that reduction. And then the only thing, other thing we didn't really mention, but I know you've covered recently on the podcast with, with David Jenkins, is that there are then some specifics around certain types of foods and nutrients yes. that can have an additional uh, LDL cholesterol lowering effect, yeah. or that's soy protein, uh, phytoestrogens, uh, and so on. Yeah. So there are these additional things that people who are really targeting mm -hmm. LDL Maximal cholesterol can reduction. do from a dietary perspective. Uh, and again, that can be brought back into the context of, okay, there's these specific individual nutrients and foods, but then we can also make that part of an overall uh, right. dietary pattern mm. as well. Yeah. I, I like the dietary portfolio in that it kind of focuses on what you add. So yes. you can look at your current diet and you, you don't have to... Can, you don't have to think about just completely abandoning that mm -hmm. if you don't want to. Yeah. And you can sort of draw on all these different... Um, yeah food groups and, and supplements that um, have been shown to be helpful. Yeah. yeah. And it's given in, in terms of foods and also in, in portion sizes mm -hmm. that are very doable. Yeah. Like yeah. They're, they're not major changes that someone needs to overhaul. On the on the top of, uh, and that's the thing about the portfolio, it's, it's based on the top of an already healthy mm -hmm. dietary pattern. These are some changes that people could do conceivably quite easily, mm -hmm. um, unless they're scared of soy, for example, yeah, which is yeah. maybe a large part of the community who well, need know, to lower their cholesterol. I know is a big risk. <laughs> 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 I remember that episode we did, and and I think you had a a, a bottle of soy I had milk a or something, soy and it fell off the table. The camera. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just opened it, but it's sitting there with a bottle of soy milk. Oh, Alan Flanagan, yeah. always full of gags. Um, <laughs> you know, um, have you done a? Have you dedicated an episode to LP Little A? No, no not specifically. You haven't. No, okay. No. Um, without going into lots of details, you just mentioned it earlier, mm -hmm. kind of flippantly. People mm -hmm. may have heard of it, but it, what would you want people to know about LP Little A or just kind of be aware of? They might, it might be something that they learn more about in, in, in the coming years. Well, it, it looks like it's probably going to be declared the kind of, the, the, the second causal biomarker for, for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. It's, it's kind of like an LDL molecule, essentially, um, with, with some differences and mm -hmm. Um, you know, we don't have to get into the kind of like no, no, no. protein technicalities, but it's it's similar to an LDL, um, slightly different. It expresses this little A, so it's not a necessarily in a kind of, but um, you know, some characteristic differences. But but LP little A is um, 
certainly in the epidemiology, just again, linear association with cardiovascular disease. Um, there's been, it's been noted as part of the picture of some of the intervention trials in terms of lowering it. But there's been to date, and it's being kind of developed now, um, the previous interventions that have all been on the major LDL lowering drugs that we have really don't tar directly target LP uh -huh. little a. It seems to be primarily driven by genetics. Mm. There's very little evidence that we have that diet makes a kind of a meaningful difference to LP little a. It, it looks like addressing it is going, and, and what, what factors then influence it on top of genetics are, so that there, there are open questions in the LP little a story, but in terms of a body of evidence that supports its role as a, as a causal biomarker, you know, that really is coming from, from the graded kind of linear temporal relationship observed in population research as well as the evidence, you know, for, for, for its kind of, um, you know, the, the, the kind of mechanistic side, mm. uh, as well as some of the kind of secondary evidence from some of the, the statin mm. and other intervention trials. I think, again, Fourier that seemed to, seemed to have a reduction in LP mm. little a in that trial, although it was using PCSK9 inhibitor. Mm. So yeah, it, 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 you know, as a, it, it probably is going to become a kind of a direct target for mm. treatment. Um, but what agents are going to be used to, uh, to, to achieve that are still in, in kind of development. Yeah. So, so I guess that's the important distinction, right? That changes that we see in, in reducing LDL cholesterol don't necessarily have that impact with LP little a. Mm. S certainly from a dietary perspective. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I think it was um, maybe Penny Chris Etherington's group did a paper on like the dietary impacts on LP little a and largely it's just kind of no real yeah, pattern, right? Some yeah. changes, some no changes, nothing that really kind of shakes out. Um, I, I know there was, because I, I went looking after uh, the, the Saladino claim that Seed oils drive up your LP, LP little a. a. Uh, of course, seed oils do it. Of course. So I was like, where might this come from? Uh, there was one like abstract I could find from a study that was actually done in Spanish, or I don't have the full text that um, he didn't necessarily link to, but it was the only thing I could think of maybe where is this coming from that looked at a dietary substitution in 40 something people. And they seemed to show that there was, uh, in some of the cases, there was the opposite effect on LDL cholesterol mm. and LP little a. So the group where they reduced saturated fat and added PUFA had the uh, a slight elevation in LP little a despite mm. a drop in LDL cholesterol. Now that was a, a, a small comparative right. study. Like I said, I, I, I haven't read yeah. the full text because uh, my Spanish is not that mm. good. Um, but again, that would be a perfect example of where... Um, Saladino makes an absolutist statement in that video of saying yeah. seed oils increase your LP little a and then he moves on yeah. uh, on the basis and then mm. nothing to support that despite the best researchers in this area mm. are still of the position look we don't really know yeah. how strongly diet yeah. affects this if at all it's largely genetic um, and so yeah I think that would be the only other thing I'd add on yeah the, I, I listened to Thomas Dayspring speak with Gil Carvalho mm. Dr. Gill recently, mm -hmm. who we both had on the, on the show yes. and um, really great guy. And um, one thing that he said that I thought, a couple of things that he said about LP little a that I think were interesting and I'll link to this, um, co this conversation, but he said he thinks for it to be meaningful reduction needs to be like 80% which is much higher than you can mm. get through dietary changes if mm. there are any. Mm. And then the other thing that he said that I thought was interesting was that there are some trials, I think it was with statins, where they reduced LDL cholesterol with statins, but LP little a actually went up. Mm. But the overall net was benefit. So mm. he was reiterating the point that even in that context, and there's still a lot of further exploration around ways to lower LP little a through mm. other drugs, even within that context, the, the fact that LPA little a went up a little bit wasn't enough to negatively affect the outcome right. of the trial. And, and yeah. the, the lowering of LDL cholesterol outweighed that. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's um, but I guess just put just flagging it to put it mm. on people's radar for now. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's a story that is evolving. So yeah, I think anyone coming to hard and fast conclusions as to the, you know, any, any sort of kind of, Certainly, dietary interventions for LP little a is uh, low, low seed people, oil diet. Low seed oil diet, mm. you know, 
Yeah. Well, what have you been doing in, in, in Oz? I'm interested. The, the uh, ozone layer is a little different here. Have you been trying to reduce the seed oil <laughs> intake to avoid the, the sunburn? I, I have, and, and it's worked, you know, in this... <laughs> You know, I, I was, you know, I, was, I thought maybe I could eat seed oils because it's winter, but you know, it's actually twenty three degrees basically. Yeah. So you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll keep, I'll keep my seed oils low, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll increase my, uh, I'll, I'll go on a, a low carb diet, which means uh, I want sunburn. Yeah. yeah. Have you done an episode? Can you flag that? I'd like, I'd like you guys to do an episode at some stage on seed oils and and skin. Wow. And yeah, skin. skin. <laughs> Two of your favorite topics. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Two areas you hate. Yeah. Okay, cool. Let's let's leave it there. Excellent. Thank you very much, lads. Thanks um, so much for having me here. And it's been great. I really love the work that you guys do with with Sigma. That's I think kind. it's it's incredible. It's a, a huge service that you're offering, and um, I've been a long time listener, so it's fun to have you here in yeah, person. It's great. And it's great. Yeah, I wish that I wish you. that you. Uh, lived around the corner we're on we the other side this. of the world yeah. Yeah. Man, I wish I lived around the corner <laughs> <laughs> uh, well you're always welcome back in the den we will be okay. excellent thanks Jen. thanks so much man thank you for joining me for this episode and your interest in science based conversation I hope you enjoyed it and found the information covered interesting and instructive if you did and you'd like to show your support for the show please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can stay up to date with new episodes and watch them in video format Yes, the full-length videos. Please also consider subscribing to the show on the Spotify and or Apple Podcast app, wherever you enjoy listening to podcasts. You can also leave a review on Apple or Spotify. Again, a great way to support the show and make our content more discoverable for others to enjoy and learn from. If you have any comments about the episodes, suggestions for future episodes, including guests you'd like to see on the show, or questions that you'd like to have answered, please leave those in the comments section on YouTube. I myself and my team will take note of these comments when planning future episodes. Finally, the best way to support the show and receive discounts on products we love is by checking out our sponsors at theproof.com forward slash friends. Enjoy your week, stay well, and I look forward to catching you in the next episode.